welcome, MetaZoo community. How are you? Uh, my name is Tremantic. I am joined today by the one and the only Mike Waddell, the creator of MetaZoo. Um, I can't even begin to, to describe how excited I am for this conversation. I've been wanting to actually talk with Mike for months. Um, hi, Mike. Thanks. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited as well. Um, I feel like I'm geeking out a little bit. Uh, but I got tons of really great questions for Mike. Um, I, I know that uh, some of the community might have more questions and stuff like that as well, too. So if you want, please hold on to them until towards the end. Um, we'll definitely try to highlight some of those. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm excited for this. For for those who don't know, um, I am Tormentic. I am obsessed with the lore and the storyline of MetaZoo. Um, I have been trying my hardest to try to get that out to people, to try to get people involved with the storyline and lore so they not only just like the cards, they like the products, but they actually just start investing into that storyline and lore, those characters. And so I can't even begin, like I said, to say how, how excited I am for this conversation and this, this interview. Thank you so much, Mike. Yeah, of course. No, it's uh, like I was saying uh, before, before we started live, you know, you're the first person to really, really dive deep into the lore. So uh, I think it makes sense to, to do a deep dive with you uh, on one of these interviews. Uh, one of my favorite conversations, actually, because you and I, we've talked off and on a little bit, but one of my favorite conversations, and I still want to turn it into an actual video, is the um, evergreen conversation we had in the Lore Channel a couple weeks ago. I, I I wish you could have seen my face when you actually started going more in-depth about potential and the percentages and every, I, like everything about that. That was the first time we'd ever really gotten any sort of any indication about power potential or even touching a little bit on the abstract powers and just I, I i definitely need to make that into a video to actually explain that power progression and how you explain the evergreens yeah no it's it's it, it took a lot of you know because in the books we're going to be going through training and power scaling and and one of my favorite things in any sort of ip is um kind of like a comparison of, of a character's growth to his or herself um, in the past with where they are now and where they're going. And then of course you kind of get that, um, that pit in your stomach when you, when you read or you see something that indicates that a new character is like in comparison to other characters that you, you know, that you're familiar with is like really powerful. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but you have to do it properly, right? Like the power scaling can't, um, it has to be consistent. Right. And, and I think, um you can't go dbz in essence because yeah, <laughs> yeah and, you know in dbz they 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 did it really well initially but now it's just like um one of my favorite comments i saw about the dragon ball super um series was once um um goku's new transformation was revealed it was like you know the it was amazing it was incredible but then somebody said like oh yeah but in like two months a a turtle with a backpack on is going to like defeat Goku. And it's like, ugh, yeah, of course, it's, right. That's true. That's accurate. That's super accurate. And, and the other thing that you need to have that, that I think like DBZ, for instance, failed to do was um, the, the villains were always just powerful enough to give them a challenge, but not powerful enough such that they were completely like devastated. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and it's kind of like, Oh, well, isn't that convenient? where, you know, uh, Vegeta comes and he's just powerful enough such that Goku has to surpass his limits just enough to beat him. But, like, what if during the Saiyan saga, for instance, um, Cell came about, right? Then, like, of course, uh, Cell would have just, like, wiped the board with him, right? And, and, and so it, it's convenient from a storytelling perspective, but from a world-building perspective, mm -hmm. you're like – all right, well, I know that the power scale will be this much, and I know that eventually our, our hero will uh, overcome them and surpass them. And it becomes formulaic in a way that I, I think is limiting. Um, so, you know, the, the best ones are always kind of like, you know, with, with Naruto, for instance, it's brilliant because we're introduced to uh, the Akatsuki, right? Mm -hmm. And they, you know, and, and Naruto is still a kid, and, and there's no way in hell He's going to be yeah. um, any of them, right? And, and he has to rely on on mentors to kind of in, in teams and circumstances to actually um, take them down. And when they do it, it's actually a challenge, right? And, and there's power scaling that happens with the villains as well. But 
Yep. You know pretty much from the beginning who the most powerful characters are, and that really doesn't change. Um, and yeah, so it's interesting. What, uh, what the one I always use for power progression is uh, Bleach. I love the power progression in Bleach, how they go from like the regular Soul Reapers to the Bunkai's to, and that, that in my opinion, I think is like the perfect power progression because, like you were saying, there's always a villain who's a little bit stronger, but the only reason they're stronger is just because of a new technique that the the main protagonist hasn't learned. I do think I do think that um, Bleach did suffer from um, almost what DBZ suffered from in the sense that, like, so originally the, the creator of, of Dragon Ball Z wanted uh, the Frieza saga, the Namek saga, right, to mm-hmm. be the final saga, right? And, and then afterwards, it's kind of like, all right, we, we're going to continue. And then, okay, how do we surpass kind of what we've done before? Um, well, you we have to introduce new villains that just so happen to be more powerful than the emperor of the galaxy, yeah, yeah. right? And it's like, oh, well, they're robots. And it's like, okay, <laughs> I, okay sure. These robots that were made by, you know, Dr. Giro just so happen to be 20 times more powerful than, you know, the emperor of the galaxy that, you know, was destroying planets with a flick of his finger, right? And, and it believes. Yeah, yeah. The Soul Society arc, I think, was meant to be kind of the the end of it, and they suffered from a similar problem where, by the end of it, um, Ishigo was was uh, one shotting vice captains with a punch, mm-hmm. and then and then you know, um, but then it's like, all right, so now Aizen is, is super powerful. He stops Ishigo's blade with one finger, um, and then you have all these captains that were defeated by Ichigo, and it's like. Well, they, they still have to be relevant to the story. How do we make them more powerful? And, and the way that they did it, of course, is by nerfing the shit out of Ichigo. And it's like there, after the after the Waco Mundo arc, and he defeats Aizen and the Iron Cars. There is no more um, Bleach, in my opinion. Yeah, he, he never loses his power. I love the whole idea of them going with the Quincy's, but like he doesn't lose his power. There is not like none of that exists. That's that's just fan fiction, in my opinion. Right. Oh my gosh. After after he defeats Aizen and, and has to go back to the uh, I, I forgot what that arc is called. It's not the the thousand year arc, it's the one before that with like the human yep. stuff. It's I like, didn't I'll be honest, I know I I stopped watching. I, I almost kind of refused to watch after the Waco Mundo arc because I'm like, no, that was the perfect way to end it. Why are you why why are you trying to make this longer than it needs to be? And and, and the creator, uh I believe his name is Tito, right? Um mm-hmm. He or Keto Tito, um, he was feeling the same like fatigue, and, and you could tell. And there's a lot of analysis at the time being done on the manga because if you look at the original manga, um, all the way through the Soul Society arc, um, the the amount of detail in each panel was like it was like a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. And then you got kind of the hunter 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 treatment where um, Echo Mundo was like this barren wasteland. It didn't have any sort of culture or anything interesting going on about it. And that seemed intentional. But when you hear the, uh, the interview from the creator, he's like, yeah, I burned out and I didn't really want to. And, and so Hueco Mundo arc was like, was really just a rehash of what they did with soul society. But instead of the captains, it was the, uh, uh wrong car, right? Yeah, it's true. That's true. It's completely, that's accurate. Yeah. 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 I never thought of it like that. And so, you know, I think it would, the progression up until that point was beautiful because his um, the, the week to week thing was like a a, a, a a creature feature every week, right? Mm-hmm. And then and then you're like, okay, this is interesting. He's a spirit detective, kind of like you, Hakusho. And then you know, and then and then we get introduced to this larger world, um, and you're like, wow, this is completely different, right? You have the captains, you have you have Soul Society, you have um, these like really, really powerful characters that Ichigo shouldn't really be able to touch, but you know, he's able to, and it's like, okay, cool. And then it reaches its terminal and they're like, all right, he beat a bunch of captains. Um, Aizen's still a big bad and he's, you know, sufficiently bad enough, I guess, for us to continue. But then it's just like, instead of, go- instead of that, that creative jump, uh, from, you know, spirit detective creature feature weekly, um, to soul society. It's just like another soul society type thing um, that follows the soul society arc, which was just like, you know, okay, you have the, you have the Espada and it's like, they're, they're just as powerful as captains. And it's like, okay, cool. And there's, you know, anyways, mm-hmm. so, you know, 
it's a good lesson, um, I think, in storytelling where having a terminal is not a bad thing, right? And, and having an end to a story that, that fits and that you work up to um, matters. And I think as, as amazing as Naruto was, um, the follow-up with Boruto falls under the same thing where it's like, yeah, they really should have just ended it with Naruto. Um, yeah, and Baruto kind of, in my opinion, was a cash grab almost. I, I hate using that phrase, but they just wanted to continue the storyline because of how successful it was. I 100% agree with you, though, about how every great story has an ending, and no one ever wants to reach that ending. No one ever wants that ride to stop. But in order for you to appreciate the entirety of the story, there has to be a definitive end for it. Right. And, and it, once you kind of go beyond that, um, it, it, and, and, and it's such a, I, and I understand like the desire because as a fan, like I want to see what, what's beyond that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the anime that does it or the manga that does it really well is Hunter Hunter, where every arc is sufficiently different. Like, Okay, so you, you, you started off with uh, the the hunter exam, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you had the, um, what was it? The, the, the tower, then yeah. learning how to use Nin. Yeah. You had the tower, which is really different. It was, it was like, you know, a very typical uh, tower-based tournament style thing, which was really cool. Um, and then you had uh, Greed on No, no, then you had the uh, auction. Um, oh, auction. yeah. Yeah, yeah. The auction in between before the ants with the spiders and then and then and then you had a uh, greed island and and greed island was so different from everything else and then and then greed island ended and then you had the the ant arc and the chimera ant arc mm -hmm. and that ended and you're like that was completely different from everything else and then and then now they're doing the um what's it called the uh outer world arc and it's been going on for 10 years because the the artist uh the creator's sick right and, and he mm -hmm. takes three year long hiatuses. And, and so, um, but, but I respect that more than, you know, giving it off to a, a creative team that doesn't care as much about the property who just rehashes yeah. the same stuff, right? Like Boruto, it's like, all right, well, we don't have uh, Jiraiya anymore. Well, we have his clone. Ha -ha. <laughs> um, and his clone is, you know, kind of powerful, I guess. And it's just, just like, ugh. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I, I, that's, and that's one thing that I actually really, I, I, we're talking anime, so I have to, of course, bring up One Piece. One Piece is probably one of my favorite shows of all time, um, just because of the, the difference. The differences, the story arcs in them are similar, but they're different enough to where they highlight each character, like especially when they're in um, Paradise before they go over the red line. And each one of the story arcs, when they introduce the characters, and I really, really like that Oda has said uh the creator he said that there is a definitive end they are working towards the end and it's one of those where i think that even if he passes away they're still going to finish it and then that's it there's not going to be any more and he's come out and like explicitly said once the story is over the story is over we're not doing anything else with luffy and the pirates and it's been going on for 25 years <laughs> and, and they did they did the right thing where like the admirals and the the pirate kings and stuff like that were sufficiently powerful from the beginning, and Luffy's been working up to defeating them and, and like getting to the rank, but he's still like they're still definitively like more powerful people than Luffy, even though he's oh, yeah. all this growth. And, and they didn't they didn't like blow that uh, up too early, like I think Bleach did, for instance, and and. I could see that comparison to One Piece. Yeah, I could see how One Piece or uh, uh, Bleach actually went straight to the power. Whereas with Luffy, it wasn't until what, like, I think it was issue, ele how, it was like issue 1100 something where we actually found out what Luffy's true um, devil fruit power was. Mm hmm. And, and yeah, and like, and that's that's one of the things. And actually, I, I will make this comparison. That's one of the things that I really like. Because I realize we've been talking for 15 minutes. We've only been talking anime. We've been talking <laughs> actually questions. But I, want, I, I love that I can make this comparison, though, between like you and Oda, for example. Because 
with Oda in One Piece, there are things that were hidden at the very beginning that we didn't really come to recognize or appreciate or even realize the significance until many, many hundreds of issues down the line. And I see the same thing, honestly, with MetaZoo, where there are things hidden right at the beginning that will come into play when we get to like Cryptid World in, in 2030 or when we get to like Grimm's Kingdom in 2027. Like there, there, and there's going to be small little things where it's like, I had no idea that played such a significant role all the way down the line. Like I'm, and that's, oh, that's one of the things I'm really excited about when it comes to like MetaZoo specifically in the storyline. And, and that's so hard to do. Like, so <laughs> le leaving those loose threads in a way that, um, you know, actually have meaning later on in the story. Um, you, you can, you can kind of do what, um, so first of all, it's really hard to do that with manga because you're doing it weekly right and so the story is being established piecemeal and so you can't go back in time like you can if you're writing a book like once you reach chapter 36 and you're like oh shit it'd be really cool if i like added a reference to this thing as an easter egg in chapter three right like you can't go back in time and rewrite a, ma uh, a manga chapter that was published 30 weeks ago right yeah. um and, and so the, the fact that and so what you see with a lot of manga is is things that they, they'll go back to the old so either they have that plan from the very very beginning but with these series that run for uh you know 20 to 25 years weekly it's impossible it's impossible to add all that flavor in um intentionally right um and, and so what they'll do is they'll go back to the, the older earlier issues and they'll be like oh this would be if i make this connection with this thing that we're publishing next week then it will look like an intentional thing, right? Mm -hmm. Or, and, and, and a lot of manga fail at doing that. And so you have all these loose threads or things that seemed important. Um, and, and I think we're going to see a lot of that with like uh, Jujutsu Kaisen, where, okay. um, and I'm not sure if, how familiar you are with that, but like there are all these like loose ends um, and the creator is like rushing towards the end. And I think that we're going to get a lot of untapped storylines and a lot of, Easter eggs that were hinted at or things that had potential to be Easter eggs for further development that will just kind of be left to the wayside. And, and there's a really good example of this um, lost, right? Okay. Where lost had, if you've, if you've ever watched the show, they hinted at things in season one. That oh, yeah. Like, oh yeah. Like this is totally going to be like in season seven, like it's just all kind of come together. Right. And then some things were literally just forgotten about. And, and it was like, there was never any explanation. And in the way that they ended it was kind of perfect, but it was also kind of a cop out where they were just like, it was just the island. Ha -ha. The island's the island. It was real. There was no bigger mystery. It was just, it was an island. And then you're like, okay, but they're all coming together. And it's like, no, this is the afterlife. The mm -hmm. island, just the island. And I was like, okay, I get like, okay, but what about this? And what about that? What about this? And it's like, and the writers just they didn't have enough and you, and you saw it again with like game of thrones right with the 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 series they had all these amazing loose threads that you thought were going to come together and then it was just the, the final season they were just like they didn't even bother with a lot of them like the like what was the relevance of of um the heritage of of in bloodline of um john snow yeah yeah I guess he could ride a dragon, but like surely it was more important than that and had something to do with his, his right to the throne. Okay. I guess not uh, because Bran is now King and, and who better to be King than Bran? I get right. It's like, okay, fine. So um, well, that, that a lot of, I think a lot of it, it specifically when it comes to Game of Thrones, I think a lot of their difficulty was that yes, they were working with uh, Martin, but he hadn't really written that the book that part of the book yet so they were almost in essence writing it with him at that point whereas the rest of it he he i feel like he actually had a really good handle on keeping everything up so like you said though i i, I believe that george R. R. martin actually just forgot certain character threads it, because they were so rushed if you will for the last like the, that last book that last season and, and that and i think that goes back to, to creator fatigue and we're certainly seeing that with martin or with george um and, and you know the fact that he's 
like the 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 task is too big, right? Especially since mm-hmm. the show kind of fumbled. Um, he has to come up with an ending and, and lead to it and 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 kind of weave all these loose threads together in a way that the show didn't. But like is it gonna be can, can it be sufficiently different from the show in a way that like I'm not even sure like what under what contract obligations he has with the books in order to kind of align it with the show, you know? Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. I, it's, it's just, it's inter- like, I, I, one of the things I really actually respect about you too, though, is that you have no intention. You even said you had no intention of actually making anything public or selling the company or anything. You want to keep that control over the IP and the products moving forward. And I think that's one of the things that he might have suffered from was that, yes, he had all of the support and everything of HBO, but at the end of the day, he still didn't have that full creative control. Yeah, and, and, and I'm going to try and maintain controls for as long as I can. Um, obviously, with more cooks coming into the kitchen with the show and with editors for the books and stuff like that, it'll be it'll be like riding lightning, right? But um, I'm here for it, right? And, and, and the real difficulty, like the challenge will be – so when, when something like Netflix or Amazon buys the rights to a property, they, they do more than just buy the rights if they're interested enough. They'll actually buy – equity in the company and, and, and try and own more than just the rights. Right. Oh, okay. And that maybe that's a an industry secret. I'm not sure, but, but it's certainly something that I'm, I'm having to um, potentially grapple with, which is the fact that um, creative control when money is involved becomes very quickly something that um, is a hot commodity, right? Mm-hmm. Um, they're buying the right to, you know, have, um, you know, another great example is Harry Potter, right? Like, um, JK Rowling had some creative control over the movies, but the directors from an aesthetic perspective, mm-hmm. from what to cut out, um, they, they had a lot more say, right? Like if you remember in the Goblet of Fire, the, the maze as the end task for the, the tournament in the book, it had like a sphinx in it. It had all these different types of things yep. in it. And it, the the culmination of that in the movie, for time purposes, um, was a blowing wind. Right? It was literally like a, a wind that blew through the maze. Um, and you know that lim- that that was a limitation then on world building. Uh, it was a decision made because they wanted to give more screen time to something else. Mm-hmm. For all direction from the director and producers, right? Um, and I'm sure Rowling had something to say about that, but I'm sure on some points she was vetoed. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's interesting. Well, just from working in the industry for, for the bit that I did, it's also one of those where it's very different, the different mediums, whether it's a book or it's a comic or a manga, or it's even if it's a light novel versus a short versus a TV show versus a movie. And trying to take that same story from all of those different mediums and convey it correctly in all of the different ways, you do have to make changes sometimes. You, you definitely have to leave some of the, the awesome description that's in the book out in order to actually, if not every single TV show would be literally two and a half hours long. It starts earlier than that. I mean, it, 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 with the book, it's like, all right, the, the original Kryptonation book um, – it, it in its current form would be a thousand pages long. I'm all here for it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, all right, but no, it makes more sense from a, because we're publishing ideally uh, with a big publisher and we want this thing to be, it, we want it to cater to MetaZoo fans, but we want to bring in new fans, right? We want it to sit on a shelf somewhere and be a bestseller. And, and in order for that to happen as a, as a fantasy book, it has to, you know, probably max out at 300 pages. I'm not going to cut 700 pages from the book. What I'm going to do instead is is split Crypto Nation into three books. And then every block of, of sets will have three books. And I'm going to have a, a slightly more aggressive publishing uh, cycle where you know every year uh, two books will, will likely be published oh, rather nice. than um, – in that way, like by the time that we end Crypto Nation and start Yokai Island, ideally the three books for Crypto Nation will be published. Um, but like the alternative is, is a thousand page book that no publisher would touch. Mm -hmm. Um, and 
would sit on a shelf because a kid will look at it and be like, I'm not going to read that. Um, right. And, and so, but, but that also gives me the ability to, when I'm writing, it gives me the ability to say, all right, I got 300 pages for the first 12 to 14 chapters, right? That gives me a lot more freedom to add, add dialogue that I would otherwise have to cut. Mm -hmm. um, it would add, you know, cause if, if I wanted the first book to be 450 pages and cut it down from a thousand to that, then all that flavor and world building will be lost. And, you know, I could release a, a, an annotated version. I could, I could talk about in interviews, what was cut out, but like the book will always just be the book. Right. And so, and I can't kind of like those manga chapters that get published weekly. I can't go back and unring that bell. Right. Mm -hmm. um, once, once the book, the first book is out, I can't make edits to it, not in a meaningful way in, in terms of how people experience it and, and experience that world. Right. Um, and so I get, I have like one shot with each of these books to have it debut and, and, and have its impact. You know, it, it's kind of like if JK Rowling was like, I want to republish the first book, but add everything that I, I took out. And it's like, okay, you can do that, but that's not going to be Harry Potter. Too it's, a, it's an entirely different setting. Yeah, no, I completely get that. You have like pretty much what you're saying is you have that the one shot in order to essentially start the building of the world once the world building has begun it's just expanding on that you can't really go and retcon much, most things right and and and, and so it, it's a much more expanded version of the of the problem that mangas have on a weekly basis mm -hmm. uh, and and i was thinking about this and i was like well damn that means that instead of three uh, instead of four books right uh kryptonation yokai island uh grim's kingdom and encrypted world i'm gonna have like 12 and, and it's like, well, that means that uh, once I publish the, the first third of Cryptid Nation, I, I really have to make sure that I add the, the proper Easter eggs and the loose threads and all those things in there um, so that – because I can't unring that bell so that when I'm writing and finishing the second book, um, like my – you know, like the, the source material almost is, is done properly. Um but you know, it's certainly less of a problem than um, than, than if I was publishing weekly. And, and like, yeah. I, I kind of have the ability to to hit the restart button, and there will be really big changes to the first uh, seven chapters that that we've read, or uh, sorry, six chapters that are available. Um, and but that's like that's it. Once this book is published, like it's the book, right? Um, so yeah, it's it's an interesting like problem to have, but. Yeah, I'm certainly sitting better than I think a lot of manga writers who um, have that problem like tenfold. Oh, okay. No, that that's all. That's that's kind of exciting too. What you just said, though, about there being slight changes between the first six, seven chapters and and the book. I'm excited about that. Um, all right. So, <laughs> almost thirty minutes into this interview, I want to ask you the first question that I actually have um that was that was great too i had i had no idea we were going to that long of, of an anime talk that was great. <laughs> <laughs> um okay so first question i always ask everybody what is your favorite cryptid and why is it squonk oh man i wish it were squonk um but squonk was one of those interesting characters where uh the fans like he, for me it was just a, a a random fearsome critter you know um kind of one of those funny ones like Gumbaru. But like the kind of the beauty of MetaZoo is is once I put the the cards out there, I have no control over who the fan favorites will be. Right. <laughs> That's true. Now, now, now there's a certain amount of engineering that you have to put into it. Like I knew that Mothman would be popular. And I knew that the the big beasties like you know Piazza Bird and Hodag were iconic enough that um I thought that they would be popular and, and, and it's like, I wish I could have that organic squonk like love grow um, without any sort of invisible hand from me. But like, we have to determine what will be popular with as, as much um, wisdom as possible. Uh, otherwise we wouldn't be able to d determine uh, rarities, right? Like what, why is snipe, mm -hmm. why is snipe a good holographic card? Well, it's cute and it's, it's, it's iconic looking and it's uh, lightning and, and it, I, I perceive it to be something that could be popular. So I, I tell R and D like, you know, they'll come up with like a, a, um, 
an ability for it. They'll come up with like a card design for it. They'll start play testing it. And then I'll, I'll come to them much to their chagrin. And I'll be like, well, actually it's going to be a hollow. So you got to make sure that it's also kind of powerful too. And they're like, oh, God damn it. Uh, <laughs> but, but that's kind of the engineering that goes behind it. But then you have, you have duds, right? Like you have things that I projected to be popular that weren't like sinkhole Sam. Uh, one of my favorite characters, but the fans, you know, they call it Stinkle Sam. Um, and, and it's just, it's not one of the popular characters. And, and so you, you're you kind of at the behest of your fans. And that's that's a frustrating thing, but it's also like super beautiful, right? Um, and I'm sure we'll see it with the books too, where I can kind of project which characters will be popular, but they might pick up like the... Uh, the M clones that rainbow wizard has, and they might like Cassius Kane, Right. And they might be like, Oh, like we really love these M clones. And I'm like, really? They're just like, this. okay, you guys like, that's fine. Yeah, fine. Sure. 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 Um, <laughs> and that might dictate based on that reception. And, that, and this is one of the benefits of publishing three books as opposed to one that might dictate um, what changes I might make in the second and third book um, based on that feedback. Right. So the, you know, right now I have a living document, right? I have a 300 page uh, story Bible and it, it goes through the first 36 chapters of the, um, of the, of cryptid nation. And, and I make edits to it every day based on, as I'm writing, you know, what, uh, what changes I see fit, you know, and it's, it's one of those things where I don't have that feedback yet. Um, and so, you know, anyways, that's a long story as to, to, to explain why Squonk is popular and why it's surprising, but my favorite cryptid to answer your question, um, I don't know, man. Um, I like Mothman. I love Bigfoot, Flatwoods Monster. Um, I love, um, I love Piazza Bird. I love, um, Walking Sam. Like these are all the mascots mm -hmm. sets for a reason, right? And, you know, I like, I like things that are, that look different, that have like a really cool background story and, and it resonates with me personally. And, and, um, yeah, I mean, but like with UFO Flatwoods monster, it, it, it is a world renowned, well-known, very popular cryptid, but with the MetaZoo community, it's just kind of like one, it's just another cryptid, right? It's another beastie. Mm -hmm. um, I know in Japan, for instance, Flatwoods Monster has a, a massive, massive cult following. Uh, and see, I didn't actually know that until uh, Dee's presentation at uh, the Water Tower at the Loveland Frogman Festival. I watched the presentation. I had no idea it was so prevalent in Japan. Yeah, they love it. They love it. I mean, um, they love her, I should say. Um, <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's, I don't know, it's fascinating. And, and that's kind of the cool thing about the creating this IP based off of pre-existing public domain entities, right? Which is um, every cryptid, most of them have like a, an embedded established fan base that predates Metazoo. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we have some creative liberties with how we present it, um, its place in the story, but you kind of want to you want to stay true to the story out of respect in many cases, but then also because you want to tap into that that pre existing fan base. Well, that's one of the things too that I've I've been I've been repeating a lot lately too is one of the very unique things about MetaZoo and why I've seen I feel like I've seen so much exponential growth, especially since New York Comic Con. It's it's specifically that is because Mothman Festival really taught me this too. The cryptids themselves are part of our own personal story, our own personal lore. We grew up with these stories of, of Mothman or Bigfoot or even something down to the Rocky Mountain Barking Spiders. Like, you remember, like, something your granddad or something would actually say. Yeah. Like that, by the way, I lost it when I actually made that connection. I did it on a live stream and I lost <laughs> it when I made that connection. But you have all of these these creatures that, again, we we grew up with that are part of our own personal story, our own personal lore. And that's one of the big things that I think will draw people into not just the game, but the products and, and all of the everything, because it, it's a part of us. It's it's who we are. And that's why I can't wait to expand to, to Yokai or Grimm, because right now it's so focused on North America, which is 
first unique because I can't think of anything that's specifically regionally focused on an area as much as like MetaZoo has. But we're going to expand to to yokai and and, and Asian, and then we're going to go over to to Europe for Grimm's Kingdom. An encrypted world could encompass anything from Africa to Australia to South America. Like, there's just so much potential. But at the end of the day, it's still creatures that exist in in our actual stories and our actual like folk folk tales. And it's that yeah. that's. It's it's phenomenal. It's it's that actually um that actually is a great que- uh, a segue to the the next question I have. It's um, do you remember when you first thought of MetaZoo and what was your first initial uh, initial reaction to the to that thought to the idea of what MetaZoo could be? So originally, um, I so originally, I was like. I kind of grappled with the idea of doing something completely original, but then I was like, no one's going to give a shit. Right. I wasn't going to care. Um, so I was like, it makes much more sense to, to focus on things that people already love. Right. Um, and it actually brought me to, um, I was a big fan. So when I was at, at grad school, I was a big fan of, of looking up like really, really, uh, old silver age gold age uh comics that weren't that were no longer in production right um and surprisingly a lot of these characters that at one point decades ago uh had you know burst a bursting fandom with you know probably tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of fans uh just kind of fell off the map right and like even ones like felix the cat was it was a character that is public domain. Um, oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Yeah. And you know, certain representations of Felix the Cat are still copyrighted by like Warner Bros and stuff like that. But the entity itself, the the, the creature itself is is public domain. Um, and it, it brought me to a lot of like old comic characters um, that are like the ghost is super iconic and it kind of looks like a cuphead type character um and so the the very 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 first cards that i made were actually for this game called uh golden age heroes and it it was um it actually used art from these public domain comic books and it was done in the style of of uh it kind of looked like comic book pages and i printed these at home and then i was like i guess this is kind of cool um, <laughs> and, and, but I was like, but you know, there, there was already a, a comic book series that was released in, in the past decade that did this and, and it was done by a major, uh, publishing house and it, it, it revamped a lot of these old characters in a series where, um, they basically travel through time and they end up in the modern world and they actually interact with like some more well-known uh, you know, currently established, you know, uh, comic book characters. And it's, it's super interesting, right? Yeah, uh, that, sounds, that sounds pretty interesting. I, uh, they bring, they're trying to resurrect old characters. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, um, but it's like, okay. So I'm like, all right, cool. And then I, and I was like, all right, what other kind of public domain characters are there? And then um, the other first card that I uh, ever made, well, it, it brought me to Yokai, right? Um, and my, the, the, the first cryptid type creature that I actually ever printed and made a card of was, um, and, and let me see if I can find on my phone, um, an image of the card, but it was, it was a, a fire dre- fire breathing, uh, chicken called Basan. <laughs> <laughs> Is that an actual yokai? Yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hold on, let me find it. it. And so, you know, I was using all my homemade techniques to make this thing. I would, what I would do is I would. Um, so I, I ended up buying a UV printer that could print uh, white pigment ink, which you know, like your normal printer will print tr- uh, translucent ink, um, and that, like, it looks. It doesn't look translucent because you're printing it on white paper. But if you print on black paper, for instance you won't be able to see the ink, right? Cause it's transparent. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, which is fine if you want to print and have the whole card be hollow, but,
but if you want the the card to have selective uh, masking of hollow versus non hollow uh, parts, you have to print ink on top of white ink. First, you have to have the hollow layer, and then you print white ink on top of it in the places where you don't want hollow, and then you print um, translucent ink on top of that, right? Um, and then you cross it. And so I was doing this all at home, and oh, that's uh, impressive. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're kind of scuffed, but let me see if I can find an image that you can share. Uh, if I send it to you on, on discord, feel free to share it on, like put it up as the image. Okay. Um, oh wait, cardboard and cafe just sent it to me. Yeah, there you go. Um, one second, save image. Um, one second. Thank you, uh, Crypto Nation News. Um, and so, you know, I made this at home and, and I was like, I, well, I can't do gloss layer. So what I did was, because um, a gloss layer is a whole different type of printing process and requires, you know, a, a UV light drying thing that my, my printer just didn't have because it was a scuffed, crappy version of like, you know, mainline printers. Um, and... Um, then I was like, all right, this is cool. This is cool, right? Um, and then I was like, okay, but did you get it? On a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm adding it right here. I just had to add it to the screen real quick. Um, and it was like, all right. But then like Yokai Watch already kind of did Yokai. And I was like, all right, fine. And I was like, and then, and then just something clicked. And um, I remembered, you know, watching Mothman Prophecies as a kid. And um, I was like, all right. What you know? What is what is Mothman? I guess you could say it's the same thing as Bigfoot. And then I found the term, you know, cryptozoology as a study of these like uh, mythological, not mythological, but kind of like urban legend. Mm -hmm. creatures. Um, and you know, cryptozoology is is mainly focused That's cool. as a study um, in the U.S. right or North America. So I was like, no, bingo, bango, like that. There it is. And I, and I started doing more research into it. And I was like, oh my gosh, there are thousands of these things. And they're all kind of unique looking and they all have like uh, their own little fandom and they all have their own little local stories associated with them. And like my first question was like, why the hell did no one ever do this before? <laughs> um, and so then I started making the first, the very, very first Mothman cards. Um, okay. The prototype ones that you've shown us in the Discord before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, that... uh that was the start of it. And that was, so it was, it was a process. It was a process that took about six months from, you know, creating the golden age heroes to, and I think you could probably still find the Instagram page uh, for golden age heroes. If you want to pull it up, actually, let me try and do that uh, where I posted the first few cards. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool that you actually, you still kept that active or well, not active, but you still kept that up, even though you, you switched gears over to the cryptids with MetaZoo. Yeah, I guess it's not. Dang. Let me see. I have other photos of that. I'm not sure if anyone else. Uh, I don't know. Knowing Ian, he might have it. Somebody. <laughs> might have it, yeah. Um, Crypto Nation News, if you have it, maybe I posted it at some point. But um, anyway, so yeah, that was that was kind of the genesis of it all. That's awesome. Uh, okay, so that brings me actually to the next question I have. How long did you actually research before you put the before you actually put either the initial idea together or landed on the full concept of solely focusing on cryptids? So I actually said this in the podcast interview that just aired today with a cryptic cocktail, um, and I remember. So it, it, the vast majority of the research took place in 2019. Uh, okay. For Cryptids. And I remember, um, I remember being in Sleepy Hollow for Halloween uh, 2019, and God dang, it was so long ago. Um, and you know, my partner at the time getting upset with me because she was like trying to get dressed so we could go out, and I was just stuck on this spreadsheet creating hundreds of cards and and really deep deep diving into the into the cryptids that were out there. And so I think I got like 600 cards made uh, oh, wow. in that spreadsheet over that weekend. But it was like really the culmination of that year of, of, of research. I was like, if I'm going to do it, I got to do it now. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And then like, and then it wasn't really until another six months. And, and then I, I started, I believe I started contacting uh, artists in like March and April of that year. And then we started getting some art going. I started talking to printers and I talked to like 20 different printers before I found one that I liked um, and that could do all the things I wanted to do. And um, it was like, you know, COVID hit and I was quarantined. And so, you know, my, my partner and I at the time, we drove uh, from New York down to Florida where my family was. And we were there for like two months. And that's really when it started um, from like March to May is when in 2020 is when it started taking form and I was accumulating card art and I was, I was paying, you know, the artists at the time now, and now it's funny to think about it, Right. But I was paying them like $20 a, a card wow. and I, I found that I found them on Instagram and they were, you know, they, they were, and still are like, you know, these artists just posting, uh, Pokemon Ken Sugimori styled art of creatures and Pokemon and Fakemon and uh, on Instagram. And I was like, Hey, I love your art style. I'm starting a card game, uh, $20 in art. And like, and there, and, and most of them were like, that's stupid. You know, <laughs> I don't, I don't mean, right. But the ones, the, the OG artists, um, you know, Kelsey, Vic, Poncho, um, they, they were the ones that were like, yeah, cool. Let's do this. Right. And so, um, by the time that may rolled around, I, I, may, June, I drove back up to, um, to New York and, um, I was, I had enough art assets together where I started putting the cards together and I, I actually programmed in Python a script that automatically generated the cards. Oh, cool. And, and we started play testing it that, that may on a website that I created and um, that went on for a few months. Um, and I believe that the first Instagram post is for May like 7th of 2020, something like that. And I, uh, I actually, let me, let me pull up a golden age here. I think. Sorry. Oh, no, uh, you're no worries. No worries. Um, but yeah, no. And, and from there, I remember August 1st. I, uh, I decided to uh, put up the Kickstarter and yeah, it was, it was a, it was crazy because like, you know, no one really cared. Right. Um, there were a few, you know, 255 people who cared. Right. Oh yeah. Um, and then of course the first couple dozen people on, on discord, but like, you know, you, that's, that's not enough to like get going, but it, apparently was um it was just it was the imagination that you tapped into like i I keep going back i always go back to the storyline and lore and even though you hadn't really published anything lore wise it it's that connection again that people have to these creatures where there's an entire there's an entire subculture in essence that is obsessed with these things and i i it was it's funny you talking about the uh the kickstarter because i had never actually seen the original uh, Kickstarter like page before, and somebody actually sent me the link yesterday, and I actually got to go through, and it was really cool to look at how it was all set up. Kind of kick myself that I I wish I would have known about MetaZoo back then because what was it a booster box for like thirty five bucks or something? I don't I don't even remember. I was just saying like some of the pledges on there were were crazy, and I wish I actually would have known about MetaZoo back in like August of twenty twenty. <laughs> Yeah, well, no one knew, right? And that's kind of the beauty of it, right? Like you, you can't know that stuff. So hold on, I'm sending you some uh, images. Okay. Uh, that you should put up on the screen. One second. All right, for sure. Uh, and, you know, and, and I say that this golden age stuff was the the very first cards that I made, but really, my partner and I, um, we started a company together that was making pure gold jewelry, and I was like, we got to make cards with this, and she's like, oh, okay. And so, so we actually, so it, it originally started out as jewelry. It, it originally started out as jewelry cards. Right. And I actually have a few of those too. Um, and, and these cards, like uh, we, we really like forget about like a printer, right. We were, we were making these by, um, it, it took us like six months all throughout. No, it took longer than that. It was like 2000, it was fall 2018. Um, 
to like spring 2019 that we made all these cards and we were making them on home printers. And um, we came up with a really clever way of, 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 um, oh, that's that's cool. Cool. And really, this is the, this is one of the golden heroes, right? That you were, you were telling yeah, me. Yeah. Oh, that so, is cool. Yeah. Felix uh, the cat. I love it. <laughs> and um, so one second. Yeah. It, and, and so, yeah, she, you know, this poor girl, right. She was, she just wanted to make jewelry and do fashion stuff. And I was like, you should paint all the cards. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, oh, okay. Um, so we did. And, and, you know, I think we ended up printing, I want to say like 67 card arts. Uh, I'm going to send you some, but okay. they're, they're, that's they're super actually, cool. They're actually functional because, um, what they were was they were like different coupons. So like you bought like some jewelry, right? And I'll, I'll send you some of the jewelry as well. Okay. And, um, you got a booster pack that was all handmade by me and my partner. And um, in this booster pack, you got these cards that functioned as as a um, as like coupons and discounts and 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 that kind of stuff. And and there's actually a video here or few that I'm going to send you to kind of show what the hollow effect was. So these were all handmade. Um, and here's the booster pack uh, by us with normal printers and just layer, layering things painstakingly. Um, and, and it took us, I can re remember the moment and that like, we finally got the, the cards to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was like a moment of like, pure joy for us and it was in you know anyway so um even though we ended up buying another printer and i started on the metazoo journey it how was, long would uh, it take you to actually make like one card for example so we were printing on a4 paper um okay. and so i'm sending it to you um and so we could print six cards on it and and we'd had to, we had, we'd have to print out the the back as another layer and then we'd glue them together and there was a bunch of other layers and stuff. And then we'd hand cut them. I bought like a card cutting machine that we tried calibrating, but it wasn't ac you know accurate enough. So this is all done by hand. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. So I sent you some right now. Um, all right, cool. And there's actually video there too um, of some of them. Um but that, you know, that was the start. I, like I, I knew I was going to make a, a card game, right? Like it was just a matter of, of what it would, uh, how it would, uh, like what kind of a card it would be. Um, hold on. It's not sending all of them. I don't think one second. Fine. If, uh, my, if my video cuts out for just a second, it's cause I'm actually jumping in to save them real quick. In case anybody is wondering. So you're probably gonna get some repeats here, but um, one second. Yeah, cool. Yeah, it's, it's at least the first two for whatever reason. But uh, oh wait, um, let me see. Um, hold on. Let me do this. I'm gonna airdrop it to myself, and then I'll I'll send them to you. All right. Um, I didn't even send the other Golden Age ones. One second. <laughs> <laughs> trying to show it's, cool stuff. Come on. We got we got to see the cool stuff. I know. Um, one second. Where are you, Golden Age? Um. So hold on. Here's some of the, the. Uh, um, oh, why? Why was it canceled? Um, trying to do this in, in real time. Um, one second. You can keep you you can ask me questions, and I'll I'll keep answering them as I figure this out. All right. Um, the next question I got for you is, um, was it uh was it hard to originally sell the idea of of MetaZoo using the cryptids? Um, like to a what, publishing company or to anybody that basically trying to, to get them to print the cards or anything. 
Not necessarily because we were doing it all ourselves, right? Like okay. obviously when we approached when we approached um, distributors initially, they were like, no, uh, we, or they didn't even respond, right? Which makes sense. Like how many how many Geo Schmoes approached them is like, I got a new card game. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, for sure. Um, and so, you know, for, I didn't like begrudge them any, the, the only one that really took a, a chance on us was, uh, actually Shaw, who was in charge of at the time, golden distribution. Okay. Uh, and so he was our first distributor and then everything else was, um, done just kind of, uh, direct to consumer. And so you could buy the original, uh, Kickstarter boxes online on our website for 50 bucks. Wow. Yeah. Um, all right. Here, let's try this again. Um, okay. Let's try this. I think it's because these are so old that they have to be like downloaded from my iCloud. Oh. <laughs> and it's like my, my phone is like spazzing out. Um, if this doesn't work, then you can you can just add them. Oh, I got him! I got him! Yeah, sweet, awesome. Yeah, boy. yeah I've been wow. throwing up. I had to. I ended up actually having to take pictures of the videos you sent, uh, but I was able to actually show both of those cards, um, the like the the test cards that you actually sent me. One second. One was Mermaid Opal, and then this one, the other one right here is Will Never Be Royals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Those names are great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so okay. you, there, I just sent you two more, or yeah, ten more, and then here's the final one. So cool. you can uh, cool, 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 cool. Yeah. So, anyways, so you know, it, it was a long journey. It was it was from 2000. It was like summer 2018 to uh, summer 2020. Where you know I started making cards at home to you know doing the first Kickstarter. Nice, that's that, that's a pretty pretty quick turnaround right there. Two years. Um, the uh, next question I have for oh, if I can find my list. Here's my list. Um, you already I mean, you pretty much already answered this. Uh, I was it was going to be why cryptids? Have you always been interested in them? But you you kind of touched on this I feel already when you were talking about how they were in the public domain and you were very, very surprised that no one had actually really ever thought to, to do this with cryptids. Yeah. Yeah. No. And so I'd love to be able to say that I, I've always been like a huge, uh, crypto zoology file, zoo, zoo file, crypto zoo file. Uh, but you know, my, my experience with cryptids at the time was like Bigfoot, Chupacabra and being like absolutely terrified of, of Mothman. Uh, you know, because of, of watching Mothman prophecies as a kid. Uh, so hold on, show those uh, if you can show those uh, things I sent you. Ah, I was trying to. I don't know if I have anything that can actually open up the uh, the files though. The H R E I C. Yeah. Um, you should be able to. They should be able to open up in preview. I think. Um. Or quick look or something ooh, like that. Ooh, oh, okay, I might be able to do it like this. I might be able to do it like this. Oh, one second for me. Um, all right, so the next question I have for you is, is there a reason why you picked the names Sam, Adam, and Rose? Um, so if you look at like a lot of the old comic book characters, like Gold Age, Silver Age, they rely on, on alliteration of the names, right? So Peter Parker um, has two Ps, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Clark Kent, you know, it's a C and a K, but it, it they sound similar, right? Um, and so, um, Adam Ackler, uh, Sam Sinclair, Rose Robinson, um, I wanted something that had uh, alliteration associated with it. Adam, so Adam, so Sam, uh, is, is actually a callback to Sam Winchester from Supernatural. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's so amazing. <laughs> and Adam. Adam, I was like, I want a powerful, like a powerful male name that isn't like sinister, but is also kind of like, you know, neutral in how it feels. Um, and then Rose, because it was, it's actually like, it's the middle name of, of my, uh, 
of a few family members. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, silly reasons like that. I, I wish there were deeper reasons, but it was just like, oh, so the name's in the family, and I like Supernatural, and Adam is a strong name. So, you know. <laughs> no, that's I, awesome. That's super fitting, actually. I, I love that you actually made this, the, the same Winchester connection like that. Yeah. <laughs> I wish I wish that there were there were like deeper reasons for all these things, but sometimes uh, a duck is just a duck, you know. Fair, no, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. Um, the next question, uh, now I don't know if you can actually answer this one, but I, I had to throw it in there because it's been a big theory of mine. Is and I know it will change once the book comes out now, but is Cryptic Nation chapters one through three of the comic and Nightfall four through six? No, 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 no. Um, okay. So I, I, initially I wanted these things to, to match the timing of the sets and, and, you know, but reality makes that much more difficult. And if I were, if I, if I could have gotten into the, the habit of publishing weekly, like I wanted to, um, but it just ended up being too crazy. Um, that format would have the story would have followed the sets. I'm glad that it didn't because now the story is much more robust and uh, special. Mm -hmm. um, and so, like you know, initially that was the intention, uh, but then like time went on, and by the time that chapter six was published, it was like it was nowhere near. So, like in chapter eight. For instance, chapter seven and chapter eight uh, is when Halloween happens. And so initially I wanted those chapters to be published during nightfall. That would have been really cool, right? Um, but, you know, it is what it is. And, and the reality of, of writing these things is is difficult. That makes sense. Yeah, I just, I, it, it was specifically in, I think, chapter three that just gave me the idea that that was technically nightfall because – they were you were very specific when you said, and they waited for nightfall to begin. And I was like, "Oh, that was great! That was awesome!" So it's just always been always been in my head. Oh, for sure, I, I do add like little things like that, like uh, references to the sets and, and whatnot. Um, but you know, it, it's and, and that there, that would have been magical to be able to do right, but unfortunately, um, time has progressed. Well, I figured, too, that pretty much what was going to happen, too, is if, if you had kept actually releasing the comics, you eventually were going to catch up and then surpass where we were with the sets. And I know that that was not you wanted to get uh, some of the sets out before really the storyline was fully diverged or divulged, I guess would be the word. Yeah. And so, for instance, war will have cards in it that match the the entirety of the book of all three books right so like the r d team and, and stuff they have the and the artists well not the artists but the r d team has um the story bible and so they know the story uh from front to back right and so war will have what will now be easter eggs uh in certain cards that uh you'll only kind of reconcile by uh, book three in encrypted nation that was uh, that was actually um, one of the next questions I had was uh, who besides you actually knows the full story of what you envision? Yeah, so it's 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 me R and D, obviously Andy, um, and then our our animators. Okay, okay, nice. Uh, these are some of the pictures right here that Mike actually sent me as well. I believe this is the uh, the original booster pack art uh, right here. <coughs> Um, now is that the booster pack art originally that that's not for the original MetaZoo. That's for the golden age, right? No, this predates golden age. This is the booster pack that we had made for the, the jewelry. Oh, for the jewelry. Okay. That, oh, that's right. Because that predated actually. Oh, wow. That's cool. That's awesome. And then these are some of the jewelry cards right here, or I'm not sure. Actually, no, that's golden age. That's golden age. Okay. He looks the cat, the ghost, uh, steel sterling, um, and steel sterling was like, I wouldn't call it. I hesitate to call him a knockoff of the Man of Steel, right? But that was functionally what he was, and so you had a lot of um, really, really popular Golden Age heroes that had echoes 
uh, people who like even today you still have like Superman based trope characters, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they try and do little twists on them and make them, um, you know, different, but like Superman, but he's evil, um, you know, stuff like that. Right. So, um, yeah. And then that right there, that's just another picture of uh, the Superman esque. And then this, ooh, what is that? So that is uh, one of the jewelry cards. Oh, so, nice. Um, you could you could redeem it for a uh, golden macaroon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome! That's cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't get the uh, for some reason. I couldn't get the uh, the MOV files to actually pull up on my phone, but I was able to actually snag some of the pictures at least like this. So that's that's really awesome just to see the pr uh, progression though of how you went from the jewelry to the golden age all the way up to the Metazoo. So that's that's really cool to see that progression. Yeah, especially do they have? I mean, I mean, checking. Do they actually have the same hollow pattern, or did you actually switch up the hollow hollow pattern after? Uh, <laughs> we went through, so the process that we did to make these cards was, um, geez, it was so like complicated. What we, what we did is we found a, a certain type of card stock. Right. Um, and I printed on top of it with laser ink, the hall of foil layer. Right. And laser ink has the property, the materials property that when it goes through a, a laminator, it heats up and it adheres to something, right? Um, to like what you put on top of it. So you could take foil uh, with an adhesive back that when heated through the laminator with the the laser ink um, stuff, like ink, ink layer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, once it gets through the laminator, uh, you can peel the hollow back and it'll only be, the hollow will only be on the uh, the area where you printed with black ink, uh, black ink with the jet printer. Um, and so, and, and the Basan is actually different. I'll, I'll, I'll say how I, I did that, but, um, well, actually it's not that different. So, uh, and then what you do is you, um, you print the in, in, in inverse, right? You, you get a, a plastic sheet, right. Of, uh, and it, it's a, it has a very specific type of projector, uh, paper, and it has a matte back and a, a, a um, and then like a flat back, which has no matte on it. And the matte is important because when you try and put uh, inkjet uh, printer ink on plastic, um, it doesn't dry, right? So oh, wow. yeah. uh, because, because the, the plastic isn't porous, mm -hmm. uh, now you can blast it with UV light and it'll dry. Um, and that's how, you know, a lot of printers work, but that could print on substrates that are like plastic and stuff. But really what you want is you want a porous, um, you want a porous layer so that when the ink gets into the pores, they dry as like little wells, as opposed to like one continuous ink layer. Right. Okay. And then, and then what you do is you take, you print it in reverse because then you flip it over and it's the matte layer of the, the sheet that is that you then put over the hollow paper that you've made. And um, when you line it up, so if you go back to the Basan, um, okay. when you line it up, um, the ink on the plastic sheet um, lines up perfectly with the hollow layer. And you, you essentially create a pseudo white, white ink layer without necessarily having access to white ink. Oh, that's that's crazy. Now, yeah. is this okay? Now, Streamy actually asked a really great question. Is this a typical process, or is this something that you had to figure out all on your own? Oh my gosh, it took us months to figure it out. Um, months and months and months to figure it out, and then you you'd have to glue it on, right? So, um, we had a spray glue that you'd spray onto the hollow paper, and then um, you you'd line it up using uh, printer markers that we made, and um, it would line up perfectly like you can see with the Basan, right? And um, and then what you do is, is, oh my gosh, and then you print the back layer and the back layer has the back of the cards, but they have to be, you know, perfectly aligned with the front of the cards, which is hard to do with an inkjet printer because 
it doesn't always print like symmetrically on the paper. Anyways, but then what we would do is we'd print a, a black layer um, on the other side of the backs, right? So it'd be like a two a two print process. And that black black layer would be our um, adhesive layer between the back and the front. Now the front is is already normal card stock with a hollow on it, and then the the plastic layer, and then uh, you adhere it. And what that gives you is it gives you black core, right? And so um, when you would shine a light through um, the card, you wouldn't be able to see through it. And I was like, wouldn't it be really cool? if like, instead of just having a black layer of ink, like we actually printed our logo into it. And so the, the black core layer in between the back and the front of the cards, which is what every card does, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you shine the light through it, it would actually show our logo. And I, I've been trying to get our printers to replicate that. But they're like, there's no way, right? Because really, really what the, the black layer is between uh, two layers of card stock and a poker card or MetaZoo card or Pokemon card, is it's actually the adhesive itself. Um, oh. so, so really our, our, uh, our printing process that we made allowed us with the tech that we came up with to kind of enhance the security properties of the, of the black core layer. That is really, really cool, though, that you could actually shine a light through them and it actually would show MetaZoo. Well, in this case, it, it was the... the the logo for uh, the jewelry company, but yeah, oh, for the, okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. That, but that's still, that's I, cause I've never heard of any, anybody ever even trying to attempt to do anything like that. Like that's super, super cool. Yeah. Someone said it's the same effort needed to make counterfeit currency. Yeah. I mean, like we, we were in it. Like we, we spent, I probably did that more than I, 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 I spent at my classes at, at grad school, <laughs> but man, it was fun and it created so many good memories. And it was like a really cool bonding experience. And, and, um, MetaZoo would not exist without it because I, I learned so much about um, the printing process and like what the, the big printers would do in order to create this tech. And so when I was finally able to approach the printers, I was like, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. Um, and I was very, very, very uh, adamant about certain things being used. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's why out of the gate are our uh, our Kickstarter had you know a plastic wrap with a uh, MetaZoo's logo on it. It was like we have to have that. Um, That's so really impressive. You were able to figure all this out. I mean, because I wouldn't even know where to begin to even try to start printing or putting anything like that together, especially with a hollow layer in it. Like that's. That's crazy. You figured that out and you were doing that at your house by your, like, I mean, you had a team, you had other people helping you, but that's still just crazy that you guys were able to just do that. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Oh, wow. Um, man, it just, wow. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm a little speechless about that. Like I had no idea that it really, it took that much to make the, I mean, not even just the, the, the original MetaZoo cards, but going all the way back to, like you were saying, the jewelry cards and then the, the golden hero cards and everything like that. Like I, that's crazy. That's super crazy. Yeah, and I think that um, this is the first time I've ever described that process. Because for a long time, when my partner and I were still together, we were like, even through Metas, we were like, we're going to keep this a secret. <laughs> um, but you know, I think I, I think it's like a a cool technique, and I might eventually do like a deeper breakdown, like showing the technique uh, for people that want to make at home cards. Um, but it was one of those things where by the end of it, we were like, wow, no one's done this before. Um, and I actually posted on the homemade TCG um, subreddit, the the videos showing the hollow layers for the jewelry card. And and people were like, how'd you do it? Like, like this is like, because those homemade TCGs, like they they all do this, right? Mm -hmm. They all try to, to do kind of the level of stuff that we were able to do. Um, and the biggest question is always like, how do you do hollow cards? That one specifically, the, the bus on that one specifically is the one that I'm just, I'm a little speechless about figured like you telling us that you made that at home and everything just because like that honest to God looks like a, a fully fledged professional card that you would find. Like I, I've just, I'm super impressed. You're able to make that at your house. And all, all at home with uh, just like homemade, like home printers, right? Like yeah. off printers. Like that's that's crazy. That's so crazy to me. And also, it just shows me your your dedication to of trying to actually bring this alive. Um, 
Uh, we already talked about that. Uh, the next question. Oh, was it your idea or was it Added Colors' idea to include all of the Easter eggs and all of the different theme songs? <clears throat> uh, we write it like, so I, I tell them kind of what I want, right? But they're, they're creative geniuses in and of themselves, right? So I say like, hey, you know, make sure um, that you, you, you add like UFO elements, like these are the, the key phrases and all that kind of stuff. But then they'll take it and they'll just, they do what they do, you know? Um, and it, it's kind of like, it's almost like it's the, the closest thing that I can like uh, compare it to is giving like an AI machine a bunch of parameters and being like, <laughs> great, great, like I saw a TikTok last night, which was like, uh, they, they told an AI algorithm to make a, um, a cyberpunk version of um, the office intro. I've seen that. Yes. And it was like, and it's like, it's incredible. Right. And, but like all they did was they, they, they fed it some, some images, they gave it uh, the parameters that they wanted and it spat out this thing. And then there's like adjustments that you have to do. And when working with a creative team, like added color, um, it's a very similar process where, you know, obviously instead of an AI, it's, it's, three dudes sitting in a, uh, in a studio, uh, just jamming out, you know, I, I can't, uh, honestly, I, I sent them a message a couple of weeks ago and I cannot meet, wait to meet them in New York. Like I, they're just, they're, they're really quirky and I love their, the randomness of them as well too. They'll actually use anything and everything around them in order to actually make music. Um, and it's just, yeah, their ingenuity is, is astounding. So I, I can honestly, I can't wait to meet them in New York. Oh yeah, and they're and they're they're great guys. I mean, I grew up with them in Brazil, so that's how I know them. Oh wow, nice! I didn't know that you actually grew up with them in Brazil. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. This is a, okay. So this is an actual. This is a. This is one of the ones I italicized. You don't have to answer this if if you can't. But I had to ask you since I have you here. Is there any sort of blood relation between Adam Ackler and Indrid Cold? No. Oh, okay. Like, no, you're not answering, or no, there is no, there's no blood relation. Mm, I'm just gonna leave that at no. Uh, I, 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 it's a tricksy. Okay, okay. Um, the next one is on the same uh, same token. Okay. Can you tell me any hints about Cassius Kane? Because I can't find anything about him when I look up him at all. Trying to do, re I've been researching him for seven months, and I cannot find anything about him. I will say that the the evergreen casters. Um, all have a basis in real life. I see. That's what I thought. Uh, that's what I thought, but I can't, uh, I can't figure that one out. That's one that's been bugging me. And I can't, it's one of the reasons I really want the book because yeah, I, I, I love how in the second comic you set him up, honestly, at the beginning to almost be like this benevolent character that once is trying to do good and wants to help Sam, but then towards the about halfway point of the second chapter, it's like, well, Actually, he's in this only for himself. I, I keep making the comparison. I feel like he is a Saruman character, kind of like from Lord of the Rings, but not to the extent to where he sides with evil, more to where he is of the mindset that he has a purpose, he has a goal, and whatever means necessary, he's going to fulfill that, that role, if you will. So, yeah, I mean, that's actually an apt comparison because uh, in the books, Saruman is Saruman the white, but he's also known as Saruman of the many colors. Um, and, you know, he's, his robe is described as being, you know, every color of the rainbow. Right. Um, but, you know, the Cassius Cain is an interesting character just because when I wrote him, I was like, it'd be so easy to write like a Dumbledore type character <laughs> that's like in charge of a school, but like, this is a human. Right. And so it's like, humans are complex and they're, they're, you know, I can you can you can imagine someone that's very powerful and wise, um, and maybe not fundamentally good or evil, but neutral, right? Um, and so he might actually want to help Sam, but he wants to do it in a way that is potentially self-serving. And and I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that, right? Um, and it's it's who knows what he's trying to protect. Um, you know, there's a, a war that's looming, right? Mm -hmm. And and um if you're in charge of the preeminent, you know, uh, casters university and you're, you're kind of tasked, uh, cause you work closely with, you know, the federal government within unity city to, uh, help muster 
forces, right? Mm -hmm. um, you have to be practical and, and, you know, imagine some upstart 18 year old kid shows up and is like withholding about information. Like you're probably going to be like as understanding as you can be with them. But at the same time, you're going to be like an adult and you're going to be like, yeah. okay, cool. But like, how do I access M's book? Like his spell book, like, um, where's Adam? He's a war asset, you know, like, um, because of his potential, like where, like, you know, all right, you want to answer my questions and we'll continue this conversation tomorrow. Um, and it's like, all right, um, that makes, and that made sense um, from a character development standpoint, especially as a foil to someone like M who, you know, um, I would say is much more of a Dumbledore, Dumbledore type character, but oh, yeah. we also only get a glimpse of him. And so, you know, there are human elements to him as well. And you also have to understand that these evergreen casters were casters, um, some of them were casters from before the veil is put into place. And so they're also ancient. Um, and, you know, as, as I'm sure we all know, go, get, as we get older, um, you know, experiences and, and the ups and downs of life, they leave an impact on you. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, one of the interesting questions from a lore perspective in, in reading a lot about Tolkien and, and kind of what he baked into the humanity of his characters was, if you actually read, um, you can even see this in the movies, right? Um, about Frodo and Bilbo post their adventures, um, they suffer from PTSD. They they saw horrible and experienced horrible and great things, great but horrible, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it leaves a, an impact on you. And with Frodo, it, it took the form of of him slowly uh, fading into the Wraith world and truly not feeling at home in the Shire and him having to, to uh, go off to the undying lands with the elves. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, keep in mind Tolkien was writing during the, the, the world wars. Right. And then, and following mm -hmm. that. and, and, and PTSD shell shock was like at the forefront of, of psychological studies. And, and it, it wasn't really well understood, but it was known to be kind of like uh, this horrible, horrible thing. And so, um, you can imagine with Sam's journey, but then also these evergreen casters, um, life takes a toll for sure. Well, and that's the other thing too, I I'd like to point out is that later on, I think it's in chapter five, maybe, um, love is explaining to Sam that he's now a part of this and Sam's like, well, I don't want to be a part of any war. And he goes on and he starts talking about how since the veil shattered, there had been at least a dozen, a dozen wars or crusades or raiders trying to attack towns that actually weren't protected by veils or anything themselves. And that, I mean, even at that point in 2031, Cryptid Nation is still a, it, there's a loose piece, if you will, because of the Unity City Army, but it's still very shaky. I mean, it's not fully uh, together if that makes sense yeah and, and and you know it was important for me that like the world post the veil shattering it wasn't i didn't want it to ever be considered and it should never be considered post-apocalyptic um and i think that makes it, it more challenging to write right like um the world didn't end when the veil shattered it changed and, you know, certain things about what we consider to be modern society and, and, and how it's structured and how it functions had to change with it. But um, clearly, you know, cryptid or beastie toys are being made, uh, you know, hodag O's are being made. There's the, the you know, babe, the blue ox milk, like so, mini soda. Mini, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Mini so, so like, you know, um, the society continues to function. The federal government is still there. Uh, but what you see popping up in order to address kind of these localized events and, and um, individuals for good or for bad who are armies who are as powerful as armies in and of themselves, right. Unto themselves, they're as powerful as an entire army. Right. Mm -hmm. Like how do you address that as a local uh, city or town? Um, where, you know, maybe the reach of the federal government isn't as immediate, like, right. Because like what gives a federal government, um, power, right. It, it is the projection of force and it's the monopoly on force. Right. 
And so, you know, you don't go out and there's like the social contract that's involved where you don't go out and do something that um, you don't want done unto you. But then like, obviously mm -hmm. there has to be someone that polices that. And ideally it would be some sort of uh, local force, state force, uh, and then federal force that, you know, is that projection of power and has that monopoly on power. And then as soon as you have individuals who can, who can, who are powerful enough to like change the landscape, that monopoly on power um, shifts, right? And so, yeah, Unity City has, as the federal government, it has really, really powerful casters and it has, um, you know, characters that will meet that are incredibly powerful. Uh, you have the General Ten, you have the Juggernauts, um, you have certain. Wait, 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 wait. Tell me, the Juggernauts. Yeah, well, you'll see <laughs> those later. But um, no, okay, okay, continue. <laughs> Sorry, I just I was like, wait a minute. Okay, so I'll say these about the juggernauts, right? Um, so only one in 10 people become, have the ability on average to become casters, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then you can imagine the military force, um, like, you know, special forces, for instance, if only one in 10 of them are becoming casters, what do you do with the other nine out of 10 individuals that it, it, on average, if you look at the, the military budget for special forces uh, individuals, like this is the real world, um, they spend about a million dollars on them in training every year. And so what do you do with these other nine out of 10 highly specialized, um, you know, 0.1% of the, of, of people in terms of physical and mental ability that, uh, don't have special powers. Like how do you, how do you, uh, suit them up, so to speak, um, in order to address, uh, a caster that can throw a fireball at them. Right. Um, so, you know, these, these are all like world building exercises that I went through where I was like, the world didn't end. These things all still exist. How, how do they work in this new paradigm? Um, and so, yeah. And, and so the federal government still has control over these individuals, but then you have to, to address this lack of projection and monopoly on power. You also have a lot of local militia that, that rise to prominence as well. Well, and I, I feel like you did that a really good job uh, in the comics, at least of kind of because I'll be honest, I never even once had the thought of it being post-apocalyptic because of the way that you actually described. I mean, the veil shattered and then it immediately picks up with Sam jumping down the stairs in order to get his breakfast to go to school. And I mean, once you actually get to Unity City in chapter two, you actually see cars, you see the shops like they, you explain how. A lot of power can actually be um, generated from ding bells. And so that's one of the reasons why ding bells were so endangered because cities were in essence being uh, uh, kept alive because of them. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you, you go into like when they're in unity city, like you said, you talk about the different shops, you talk about the newspaper, um, like even Sam, when he's on his way to point pleasant before he goes to Loveland castle, he stops at a roadside diner in order to actually get a hot dog. Like, so I, I'll be honest. I never once, you did a really good job with that. Cause I never once ever imagined it being post-apocalyptic. It more just uh, the changing of the world, if you will. Yeah. And, and, and it, what it does is it raises the stakes, right? Like if everything was already destroyed, like what are you fighting to protect? Um, and, you know, if you read something like the road, right. Um, uh, by McCormick, I believe, right? And he, you read any sort of like modern version of, of post apocalyptic worlds, and they're so by design, like devoid of hope. Um, and even if the characters are triumphant, if that's even a goal in the book, then it's like the world is still shit, right? Like, and, and <laughs> true, it's true. <laughs> and so, having, having a world that has gone under fundamental changes. Uh, but it's still our world, right? A, it allows the reader to connect with um, the world in, in, in a much more, it's almost kind of like, if you think about like Hogwarts, like the 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 wizarding world of, of Hogwarts and, you know, the UK at the time, it was like just different enough to, to make it interesting. But then like, it, it was still familiar things, right? Like they, they were still humans living in the world and that created all sorts of interesting juxtapositions. Um, in, in this, in my world, it's like there, that just position exists, but it's, there's no 
escaping it. There's no mm-hmm. magic that allows for wizards to live separately from humans. Like it, we all have to kind of get yeah. along. I like, I do actually like too how you kind of incorporated magic into everyday life. Um, the, the one big example is when we're listening to, I think Cyril from the radio station when he's doing his broadcast, he's actually talking about how the uh, professor of Mothman studies from unity city which I actually I made the connection a couple of weeks ago that the uh, the the person that he actually is talking about is the one also that co-wrote the well God what is it called the um the the veil it was the veil particles that actually explained why people had magical potential in themselves he was one of the ones that co-wrote it with M because yeah. that was hidden that was hidden in one of the comics but he actually is talking about how um, this uh, this professor is actually going to be calling in to the radio station. But he's not really going to be calling in. He's going to be using a spell in order to connect with the radio broadcast. And so that it only happens a couple of times, but it was really cool how you fuse together actual technology and magic together in order to make it, again, look like, of course, everything has been going on. I mean, yes, there are cities that are getting attacked. Yes, there are dark forces that amass every so often and try to attack pockets of the cryptid nation. We don't really know what the state of the rest of the world is either at this point either. And that I I don't think that it's because cryptid nation is isolated. I think it's just because you wanted to keep that separated to introduce it at a later point. Uh, But I I really like the intricate, like the inner integration. That's the word of, of everyday normal life with magic, because that's when I explain that when I explain what MetaZoo is, that's the, the thing is, as I always explain just that, the big takeaway with the uh, veil being shattered was cryptid started to appear and everybody became, had the possibility of being able to cast magic from that point forward. Yeah. And then how do you deal with that? Um, you know, clearly the humans are, are creatures of industry, right? So, you know, you're going to have creative, in- innovative people who try and integrate like magic with, with technology. Right. Um, it, 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 if, if only to make a buck, sure, but then also to help humanity, right? And, and that's kind of the the underlying tone of all of this, which is like humanity survives, and and that's that's always been my biggest gripe with with post apocalyptic uh, stories is I never think that the there's one exception uh, that I'll get into later, but like I never think that the event that happens is so catastrophic that it justifies the uh, end of world state that we see things like um in that lore um the one exception i think is is that does it really well and it's because it happens so fast is um when i read and i, I read this book like every few years because it's so amazing is uh, stephen king's the stand okay yeah and they have it's this disease called uh captain trips which is a great name um, and it, it kills 99.6% of the population in like a month. <laughs> and, and so I know clearly, um, it happens so fast that, um, you know, the world ends basically, but, th- but even then you still have humans organizing and, and kind of coming together and, and turning on electricity and doing all these things. I think that the last of us does kind of a good job with that. Um, although, you know, having zombies to, to shoot at, well, okay. If you read like world war Z, not the movie, you it's so oh, world war Z is so different than the movie. It's so yeah. much different. It, it, and if, it, if anyone wants to read a really good post-apocalyptic, uh, story, it's that because it doesn't end up being post-apocalyptic. They end up being able to, uh, they change their military tactics so that they are able to, uh, put down the hordes, Right and um the world survives and and it's actually the book is actually a collection of medical stories um that are collected after the fact after the world like you know um restarts uh, and it's all about these individual uh experiences about how they can uh how they overcame it um and it's just it's fascinating um and and, and you know what's really cool is like even even in this new world that after they defeated the scourge, like there's this great scene where the, the reporter like um, sees like a mouth in the ground. That's like chomping and like, it's been years, but like clearly there's like this residual zombie type uh, 
after effect that's on the world. But it's like, you know, imagine if, if a bunch of crazy bears in the like tens of thousands of crazy bears, like attacked the city, it'd be like devastating, but like we'd defeat them. Like, yeah, <laughs> eventually we'd kill them because they're, they're mindless beasts. Right. Like, um, and so, you know, this is a bit different because it's not zombies. It, it's, it's humans and, and, and cryptids, but cryptids are, you know, they're, Smart. they're still things, right. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're still things that can be, you know, some of them are, are clearly smarter and, and than others, but at the end of the day, Jackalope is a, is a bunny with horns on it. Right. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, and, and so that, it didn't make sense for that to, to end the world. Right. No, that makes sense. That's, it's always, I've always just, I've always described it as a, a transformation because I'm still of the mindset where I think that, and I, again, you don't have to answer this. This is just a theory of mine that all animals in essence were cryptids that were veiled because of the veil being put in place that once it shattered, they turned back into their natural state very similar to like SCP, the, the, found, the, the SCPs from the foundation. And that's part of the reasons why it caused so much chaos was because you had humans interacting with all of these magical beasts that they hadn't seen for over a thousand years. You had humans literally turning into cryptids almost if they had any sort of lineage with any sort of, of any magical being or, or creature because the thing, the way that I've always thought about it is the ever all of the magical potential whether it was a human or a cryptid or whatever all of that when the veil was put in place was sealed away it was completely cut off except for the evergreens except for the people who actually had like that sort of, of power a level power and even if it's just a small little bit to go from nothing to it immediately it it's going to cause mayhem it's going to cause chaos all over the place yeah but 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 chaos that we recover from right and, and yeah the best argument for that is like before the veil went up in place, right? Like we have from a, a thousand years ago in the real world, we have stories of dragons and mythological creatures that coexisted with mankind for uh, millennia. Right. And it's like, it, it, it wasn't devastating to the world. Um, you know, they, they certainly pose problems here and there, but like it was, it was a part of our shared folklore. Um, it was part of our shared history. And so if, if our ancestors could do it, we can certainly do it. Well, the only thing that made it truly catastrophic was the, the immediate introduction of, of these uh, entities into our world and then the release of, of potential. Yeah, that's, and, uh, I'm, so, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to read more about that in the book. Um, next question for you is, uh, do you always wear Solomon's ring? And is it being kept safe from the dark casters? I have it in safekeeping in my, in my possession. Um, I don't wear it cause it's too heavy. <laughs> uh, I got to see Andy's at the water tower. I had, by the way, I had no idea that there were, there, there might've been multiple of them, but I got to see yeah. Andy's at water tower and I was really surprised at how hefty that thing was. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, you know, Andy, Andy comes from a long line of uh, jewelers, so he was able to to handcraft those with some uh, some family connections, and so they're legitimate uh, artifacts. You know, they're they're the gem is real, the gold is real. It's uh, pretty cool. I I'm, uh, he actually uh, he he when I was looking at it, that's when I first realized that there were actually it was an inscription on the side of the ring. So I'm I am hastily trying to see if I can find the translation for that because I I'll be honest, I lost my mind a little bit. Because I'd seen the ring since you showed it, that one picture from New York Comic Con, but I had no idea that there was actual an inscription on the side of the ring. Wait, have people not uncovered what uh, the language is yet? I uh, I know I'm still I haven't actually I don't know what language it is. I I was trying to look through the uh, the Key of Solomon again, and I I didn't have I haven't had enough time to actually sit down and really start looking looking. Look look to so the the key to breaking the code is in UFO cards. Ooh, okay, hold on, let me, I need a key to unlocking it, is it UFO? Oh, is that a segue, or is that a tie to the, to the, oh, the second language, oh, the second language. Surprise, I'm surprised you haven't decoded it yet. <laughs> uh, well, I just, well, I, I just, I just saw the ring, like, last week, and I actually hadn't had a chance to really do much between working, and I'm still trying to work on the tower video, I've gotten probably about maybe a third of it done, 
Um, and so, yeah, I've just been trying to do there's not enough hours in the day. No, for sure. <laughs> that's, that's um, one of our best kept secrets of Metazoo right now is no one's decoded that that language. Oh, uh, okay. I need to. I need to actually look at that then. Okay. Oh my god, because it's, the, it's the, ah, my brain, my brain right now. A lot of things just clicked for a second. Um, okay, this is another one that I had italicized. Uh, can you give me a hint on the name of the mysterious chapter or the mysterious caster from chapter three? that arrives in the black carriage because uh, I am obsessed with trying to figure out who that guy is. Where, where, what do you think he is? What are your theories? <sighs> I, I, I'm not, I'll be honest. I don't have any sort of name for him. I thought that potentially he might've had some sort of connection with Jermaine, but for some reason his, he, he looks different than Jermaine. He, Sam does actually say that he, is some sort he reminds him of a vampire, but at that point he says that there are no known vampires in Cryptid Nation at that point. Hmm. Um, the caster gun too. He he's the only one besides I mean, I guess besides the uh, the cryptid busters, but theirs is more actually like the plasma plasma guns almost. He's the only one that really uses the caster shells and the caster gun. I I, I I wish I actually could figure out some more stuff about him, but there there is I there's not enough about him. There's not enough. So I'll say this. He's a reference to a 1980s anime movie. Um, and the caster's gun, the idea behind that uh, was actually from Outlaw Star. This oh, guy. oh, no. Are you you're, you're kidding, right? Yeah, but it was like, but it's such a clever idea, right? Like Outlaw Star has magic in it. And they're like, um, to, to form with MetaZoo, um, people encapsulated these spells into cast into um, gun shells, right? And, and yes, is able and you're able to cast it using this, right? So, um, you know, that is my favorite anime of all time. I'm not even kidding you. Like I, I, Outlaw Star is, I don't know why. Ever since I, I saw it as a kid, I've been obsessed with it in the caster shells. Like Outlaw Star is amazing, in my opinion. That scene, that scene where like, because the caster's gun, the caster gun is always like his like trump card, you know. Um, and that scene where um, an outlaw star did power scaling really well, right? They had, they had the, the, the brothers um, that like were kicking ass and then they came across the, the syndicate boss, I forgot what his name was. And the syndicate, bo syndicate boss just like, like uh, trounced them, right? Like spanked them. Um, and then uh, Gene shoots him with the, the, the black hole caster gun and uh, he gets sucked in. And then he uses his own magic to break out of the black hole. Mm -hmm. It's like, damn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. It's so. If, all right. So anybody watching, if you've never seen Outlaw Star, go and watch Outlaw Star. It is, it is amazing. It is such a good story. I wish it had more episodes though, but it is. Oh, it's such a good story. Oh man, that made my day right there. You just that you said that about actually about the caster gun. That's so because I've always thought that, but I've always been like, no, there's no way. There's no way it's Outlaw Star. You, you just gotta you gotta recognize that I'm probably a bigger geek than you, and then <laughs> I'm slowly realizing that, Mike. The, like the connections, the, connections, the the references, uh, they're all a love letter to to things that I I love. So, oh man, oh god, I love all of the little Easter eggs that you've put in in all of it, and all of the different love and the ties and stuff to all of these pop culture references, and even like little hidden messages to like subculture. Like I just uh, all of it. It's oh man. Oh uh, wow. Okay. So um next question I have for you is how much research have you been doing for Yokai Island? So when I was originally making the the cryptid list, Yokai were um a huge part of it, right? And so I actually did a lot of original art of Yokai. Let me send it to you. Um, because I was like, I'm never gonna be able to afford to be able to do the art for all this, right? So I ended up trying to do the art myself. Let me see if I can't uh send you some. Um, and so I already have like, and these will be Easter eggs for, um, man, I have to go so far back into my images. Um, <laughs> geez. Um, let me send this. So yeah, the, the answer is like a couple hundred, right? Um, but you know, they, they are, they haven't been worked on since 2020, uh, which is like kind of a beautiful thing. 
Um, because when I get back to it, it'll be like kind of like coming home a little bit. Um, see that I can see that it's kind of cool. Yeah. Cause it'd be kind of coming almost full circle in a way. Yeah. Let me send, uh, these one second. Oh, you're good. No, that's, that's, and that, so did you, once you decided to actually focus on cryptid nation for the first block, did you always decide that you were going to go to yokai or was that just something where it kind of just fell into place so yokai was originally supposed to be the second set right kind of like the books Cryptonation nation oh. was initially going to be one big ass set of like 300 cards but it was like it was too much of a task it's too big for one set um so yeah the, the the plan was always uh Krypton nation yokai island and then grim's kingdom um, and then, you know, of course, uh, Cryptid World, which <coughs> would cover, you know, the things that uh, we didn't, that we weren't able to cover uh, with just those three sets. One second. And that's, that's what's so brilliant, actually, though, about you breaking it up now and making those the blocks instead of individual sets is because... I'll be honest, you uh, in yesterday's MetaZoo Hour, you you talked about the some of the set names for yokai, and I am very very interested in Hell and Chibi. First off, yeah. and Chibi set, I can't wait for the Chibi set for the Chibis. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it gives you more freedom and gives you more flexibility to actually flush out a lot more of the specific cryptids or yokai or the fairy tales once we get the Grimm's uh, Kingdom. Instead of having to, again, kind of like going back to full circle to what we were talking about at the beginning about how this gives you the ability to, to flush more of them out, give them more of their actual own space and instead of trying to just cram as much as you can for the sake of, of, of quantity in, in such a one, like one limited set, if that makes sense. Right, yeah. So it, it allows quality over quantity uh, for sure. And, you know, I'm taking the same approach to the, the books like you just said. Well, it's, and it's, it's funny you say quality over quantity because it's almost, in my opinion, it's quantity and quality because right. you can take the time to actually, you can take your time to, to honestly get everything the way that you want it. Um, let's see if I actually, I'm trying to get this to work real quick. Sorry. So there's only one that's like recognizable really, I think to people here. And if you want to, the one with the two eyes. Okay. Yeah. But I was like, I was adamant about using uh, watercolor for these, um, and you know, you see that years later in, in the the first set where uh, that was the direction that I gave to these artists. But it's a good thing that I wasn't the one that ended up doing the art. I would, I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's impressive that you uh, that you actually can do this art too. I will say that a lot of people can either they only do. Sorry, I'm trying to save it on my phone real quick. Um, I just have to take a screenshot. Okay, well, we're just taking a screenshot. Sorry for that. Because I'll be honest, I am I am not an artist at, in any sense. So it's it's impressive that you can actually like not only have the creative vision with it, but also be able to actually do some of the renderings. Like I can I can tell somebody like exactly what I would need. For, I see in my head, but the ability to actually recreate it myself that's a little bit difficult sometimes. And there is an alternate universe where I was the original artist of all Krypton Nation and, and maybe throughout the sets you would have seen me progress as an artist and get better and better. But uh, I'm really glad that I reached out to the people that I reached out to because they're, they're the ones that made it possible, you know. Um, and because like it was, it was the art was like something that was hanging over my head um, and was just like, how am I ever going to do this, you know. Um, fireball oh. oh yeah the uh, uh, it's it's twisted sideways sorry but yeah you, you get the idea uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh that's cool and then you had yeah. one more what is that dude um he was meant to be a a, a, a yokai i forgot um which one but it was it was like a a ghostly mist with an eye in it um, a lot of yokai, it's interesting, right? So yokai are, 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 they have like the same cultural beginnings as a lot of cryptids and that they start off as urban legends, but a lot of yokai that the ones that aren't related to like deities or anything like that, um, or forest gods or mountain gods or whatever river gods, um, they are 
um, objects that are so old that they take on spirits themselves. And so you have like umbrellas that have um, that walk around and have eyes and, and or an, an wow. eye and a tongue, you know, and uh, or you have like uh, sandals that have teeth. And it's like, OK, makes sense. Right. Um, and, and, you know, but yokai are different in the sense that they're hundreds of years older. And so they've had a much longer time to ingrain themselves into um, Japanese culture and heritage um, in a way that I think cryptids will eventually in the U.S. And maybe something like MetaZoo will serve as a lightning rod to help that cultural movement along. Um, and, and that's why we're seeing the first uh, – Not I'm not taking credit for this in any way, but you know, this year I don't think it's a coincidence that we're seeing the inaugural Loveland Fest mm-hmm. – Augment Fest, the first uh, Squonkapalooza, the first you know Flatwoods uh, Festival, um, and and you know I think it's I think that well, I'll be honest know, with you, some of the people that I've actually talked to, like specifically the the Squonk Festival and stuff like that, a lot of it is because of of the moves that that you, that you and MetaZoo have been making, and I think that that's when I first set out to do MetaZoo, I was like we can make a cultural impact and. Um, I think that a lot of these cryptids and keep in mind, cryptozoology as a term has only existed since the late 1970s. Before that, they, they were just collections of, of, of campfire tales. Right. Um, and you know, culture is a delicate thing and we have languages that die out constantly, um, because they're not properly preserved or practiced. And, and I think that cultural history is no different. Right. And so I saw these things like the fearsome critters and they're only really referenced in a few books that were written over a hundred years ago. And, uh, but they were a, a big part of the lumberjack culture, which was used to be during, um, you know, the lumber era of the U S that was like a massive culture. Right. And the only one that really survived from that era in, in the modern kind of popular culture is, is babe, the blue ox and Paul Bunyan. And it's like, well, there are, there are all these other stories of, of, you know, um, these lumberjacks getting drunk and seeing weird stuff and <laughs> like a hide behind or something. Yeah. 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 And, and, and we forgot about it. Right. Like, um, and so MetaZoo for those things, like we're, we're bringing them to the forefront. I think native will do that with a lot of, um, indigenous folklore as well. That is, I think, um, hasn't been in the light as much as the, as it should be because it's part of our shared culture. Mm-hmm. And, um, and certainly these local, uh, cryptids, like if you, if you did a Loveland fest three years ago, I don't think that you'd have nearly the turnout that you would nowadays because no one really knew besides many, you know, some local people, no one knew what the Loveland Frogman was, right? Like, mm-hmm. and, and so we can, we can celebrate now in, in this really spectacular fashion. It's kind of magical, right? We can celebrate american culture in a way that um we haven't been able to before um and and we're doing it collectively um and and people understand that loveland frogman is just not loveland frogman he is part of this larger mythos that um, exists all across the united states now when you go into a small town um you can you can ask yourself the question like hey i wonder if there are any local cryptids that um have a story here and, mm-hmm. and, you know, it, it it's going to add points of tourism. It's going to drive tourism that didn't exist before. Um, and, you know, a lot of these small towns will see boons in, um, in money and, and people taking interest in, in their history. I think that's like it's such a beautiful thing. And it's, it's so, so uniquely um, attributed, I think, to, to something like MetaZoo and, and what we're doing for the larger crypto community at large. Yeah. And that's, and just to kind of go off of what you're talking about, about um, the yokai, like a lot of people don't realize too, that the yokai were actually part of Japanese uh, court. Uh, like if you want to, if you want to even say like before the veil shattered, but like historically yokai were actually part of Japanese court back in the day. And yeah. it kind of go a lot of what you're just talking about reminds me a lot of um, D the storyteller's thesis, where they were talking about how the 
the financial impacts of these cryptids in these small towns and these towns trying to capitalize on them in order to keep these towns alive. And it's kind of amazing because I can't remember what his name was, but one of the speaker, the only speaker really I had a chance to actually listen to at CryptidCon was talking about how every holler in West Virginia, for example, um, they have their own holler monster of some sort. And yeah. it's, it's, it's interesting because once you, once you start really looking and that's why I, that's why I picked up the map, the map in black, which thank you, by the way, and he ends the one that gave this to me. Um, it's amazing when you start realizing just how many, not just cryptids, but UFOs and spirits and other, like how many of those are all over the country that have literally been staring at us this entire time. And, and we've never collectively put them all together under one banner. And, and I, I have a heavily annotated version of that map, uh, as I traced, uh, the journey of our, of our characters through the crypto nation. And it's like, honestly, like at, it's such an incredible resource. And I found so many things on it that I otherwise would not have, but I also like, but there's only so much that you can add to it. Right. So I found references. Like I, I would say that the map in black is only like 20% there uh, in terms of, of like, and I was only going through like locally like where they were traveling through and I would find things that weren't on the map. And I was like, dang, like this is such, it's such a rich culture, you know? Did you update Jeff at all? So he could update the map for the next version. I want Jeff to work with me on, on the, on the, <laughs> map. Yes. if he wants access to my notes, he's going to have to work with me. Oh, that's, oh my God. I fully support that. You and Jeff would come up with an amazing map. That would be, oh, but if you do it for cryptid nation, though, you're going to have to do it for yokai and you're going to have to do it for Grimm's kingdom. You eventually will have to do it for the other continents as well. To maybe in cryptid world, you can literally just get a world map. That oh my god, that would be amazing. A world map well, I, like map in black. I, and, I, and I think that um, eventually that will be something that MetaZoo undertakes. Which is all right. We have the cryptid nation map, and it has all these things on it. Because um, just think about like all the cryptids that we have, right? Mm -hmm. um, far exceeds what's already on the the map in black right and so we could with hopefully jeff's help come up with at the end of the block excuse me at the end of the block we could come up with a much more um exhaustive uh map um and then when we do do the same thing with yokai island um we'd create really the first ever map that's uh that maps out where all the yokai are and it's like yeah, I think it'd be really cool. You know, it's 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 the result of hundreds and hundreds of hours of research, and 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 what I'm finding is is uh, people are doing their own research, and it's like there's some amazing resources out there. Um, I don't know. It's it's a it's a beautiful cultural phenomenon that we're seeing kind of happen in in real life, like at the moment, like we're part of it. You know, it's been awesome actually watching how MetaZoo has really been bringing the entire cryptozoology community up, if you will. Um, where I, I think I was, I, I think I was talking to D about this, where I'm just excited to see five, 10 years down the line, what MetaZoo has done to bring the cryptozoology and, and the cryptid community, not even just MetaZoo, but just it in general, more to the limelight, more to the actual mainstream. Just it's cause it, I can, I don't know. I, I can, I can see, I can see where some people are still on the edge. Like, Oh, well that's dude. Why are you talking about Bigfoot? But in like five, 10 years, I can see Bigfoot, for example, being talked about all the time. I, I'm just, I'm, I can't wait to actually see the exponential growth over the next couple of years. And we have a, we have a festival dedicated to squonk. I mean, that it, it, there's no better Testament to the, to the, the growth of the of the crypto community, I think Squonkapalooza is exactly that, you know. <laughs> Squonkapalooza, I can't get over that name. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's uh, some amazing things are happening for sure. Um, uh, I know you talked about this probably already before. I think you talked about this with Harley, but um, just briefly, how do you think the tower competition went um, in Loveland? Oh, I think it went great. The organizers did a fantastic job. The uh, the casters. Um, from what I saw, all had a blast. Um, it was everything that I wanted Casters Cup to be, 
but like we're learning, right? And so there, there are things that we can always improve on and, and we'll see those improvements manifest at uh, Earth, Earth Tower. And uh, we'll just get, keep getting better and better until Caster's Cup where we'll, we'll see kind of, I think, a AAA production um, and show uh, that will blow kind of the, not just the TCG community, not just the crypto community, but kind of like um, the collectibles community, like it'll blow their collective minds. Now, is there anything um, that um, that uh, you'd like to see different for the next one? So, from a, there are a few like gameplay things that I went over with uh, with Epic, um, but I think from a, a lore standpoint, I want the thematics of the towers to match the aura a bit more. Right, mm -hmm. um, this one was a little bit sparse on that front, just because we were more focused on getting the gameplay up properly. But like by the final tower before um, Caster's Cup, I want the tower itself to be in full form. Right. So uh, I want the thematics and everything. Yeah. 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 I, I want you to feel like you're playing in, in kind of like a pseudo environment, like we had at Caster's Cup, but one that's dedicated to a single aura. Ooh, that's pretty cool. That's a really, really cool idea. Um, are we going to get the, uh, will the other three towers actually be implemented next year? And if we can have frost, can it please be in December so I can play Christmas Rose? <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're going to be every month. Uh, the idea is every month we're going to have towers, so it'll just cycle through. Oh, that lose you. I think I lost you. Well, welcome to the Michael Waddell show. Um, and yeah, no, uh, this is my podcast. Ah, uh, sorry. I think I dropped out there for a second. My bad. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, Oh, yeah, all I heard was uh, Christmas Rose, and then and then I, I, I left for a second, apparently. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to cycle through the towers every month, right? So uh, we'll start off in January uh, 2024, and then every month we'll have a, a new tower. And and so we'll, we'll, we'll hit the three that we missed this year, and then we'll cycle back with uh, starting with Water Tower. Oh, nice. Okay, that's, oh, that's, so, that's super, super, super awesome. Um, do you still have plans on, cause I know it's going to be really busy with everything going on with the towers and everything. Are you still planning on trying to do the LGS tour? Eventually. Absolutely. So we're going to be debuting a, uh, a, a van, it, but it's a little bit more than a van, but it's like the MetaZoo van. Um, and it will be ideally I, I would do a tour with that, um, and visit local game stores across the, the nation. But like, I really need to get the, the first book out first. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. I'm just excited for you to come down to the Outer Banks, uh, come see Super Galactic Games and Comics. Also, I can't wait to like show you some of the, the, the history of the Outer Banks because we're the, the first place where the English had a permanent settlement. The first flight actually took place here, the graveyard of the Atlantic. Like All of the pirate uh, all lore and everything that has to do with Hatteras Island and everything, Like I, I, would, I would love to actually just take you around the beach and show you all the cool stuff. That'd be cool. Yeah, we could uh, hold hands and play with the sand. <laughs> Skip down the beach. Yeah, <laughs> watch the sunset. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, that sounds great. Yeah, and, and I want to do all that. It's just like my. Th there are certain things that only I can do right now, and I got to do them. And then I and then I'm free to kind of have fun. No, I'm, I'm glad that you're so focused on the IP too. I know that's what your focus has been on really for like the last six seven months, and. It's one of those where I always, I always tell everybody that the investment in the characters, the investment in the storyline, the lore is what is going to bring the, the longevity to, to MetaZoo. Because it's once you, once you realize why this card is special, once you realize what the significance of this character is, I feel it just it, it brings everything to a whole new level. It creates a legacy, right? Like, um, if you look at something like Lord of the Rings, the the guy wrote these amazing books decades and decades ago, and and it can be picked up 
and revitalized in a new form and uh, enjoyed by millions and millions of people around the world, either by the, the movies that came out 20 years ago or, you know, I, I begrudgingly say this, uh, the Amazon show that, you know, anyways, but, but like that leg, like once you have uh, these books, right. Once you have the IP, then that's really what spans generations. Um, and you know, we're kind of different in that we have characters that will remain relevant, um, regardless of a book being written, right? Like Bigfoot will always be Bigfoot. Mothman will always be Mothman. And so MetaZoo cards will always be connected to a larger lore. But I think that in order for MetaZoo to be fully, to take full form, it has to be kind of like Lord of the Rings took elves and dwarves and goblins and, um, you know, little people and, and put them all into a story that was cohesive. Um, MetaZoo, like I think the, the cryptid lore of the of the u.s it needs something like that that's like it it puts it all under one umbrella and and the cards can only do so much um to connect all those things uh, that's that's perfectly said um who's your favorite historical character that you would like to meet Ooh, uh probably napoleon okay why why napoleon so the the re so I, I read um, his biography. Um, this is old book. I forgot what it's called, but but um, he was able to. So his like childhood was interesting, um, and he had like these breakout moments in conflict where he was like he showed himself to be this brilliant commander uh, by putting like battery like so there, there were some ships coming through some uh corsican river i forgot what it was called and he was able to to um mount uh these battery uh like these cannons on 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 this like hillside that no one thought that he'd be able to and it gave him like uh projective power to kind of destroy this this oncoming uh fleet and he did it when he was like 26 right um, and then he had these like these other breakout moments um, where he showed himself not only to be like a capable uh, commander when it came to like military strategy, but he was also like he would f go to the front lines himself and like do all of this himself, right? Like he would he would be like battling, he'd be on horseback, like actually like slashing his sword and stuff. It was it was wild, and. Um, you read similar – and it's kind of like, all right, the only way that you can do that is if you believe that the bullets won't hit you, right? Like mm -hmm. uh, there are a few other characters like that that believed like that they were uh, almost like protected by destiny, right? So like th there was a, a raid uh, on um, George Washington through this like one thicket of, of, of trees and even like the the – Native American uh, troops that were firing at him recounted the tale that when they were firing at him, like they were firing at him at like almost like point blank, but the bullets would like zip by him. And it was like, it was like amazing, right? Like, um, and you know, even like if you read, if you read uh, Winston Churchill's biography, um, his friends like describe him as like always walking through the mists of destiny. And it's like, in order to, to be that kind of person, you have to be like, you have to believe it. Right. And, and, a lot of crazy people think that, but it's very rare to have somebody that actually believes that and they can back it up with skills, right? Napoleon mm -hmm. was so much more than just a military leader, right? He was, uh, he was, um, like he introduced the concept of medals, like, and he would hand out medals, and that was like a, a, a thing that Napoleon did, I believe, right? Like that was like his thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and like he put down the, the Paris riots, and it was just like it, but then when he was in, in, in control, um, he, he, he wasn't just like a military dictator, like the Napoleonic laws that governed, uh, most of, of Europe at the time, like he came up with and, and implemented and, and they were modern age, uh, rules of law that kind of did away with, um, what the monarchies had set up in Europe, um, mm -hmm. that, uh, were meant to quell the population. Right. Um, and, and he, he was just, they're, they're like, it was almost like he, thought of himself as like he was in a movie, right? Like when, when he was coronated by the Pope, 
um, there was this like fantastic moment where um, rather than the Pope putting the, the crown on his head, cause he, he crowned himself uh, or he, he fashioned himself the, the emperor of the French, not of France of the French. And that's important because when he would conquer new territory, he'd like wave his scepter and he'd be like, you're French. <laughs> so he rule over them. Right. But when he was, uh, when he was coronated by the Pope, he actually took the crown out of the Pope's hand and said, like, I'm the only one that has the power to, to crown myself. And then he put mm -hmm. the crown on his head. And that was like, you know, a really big indication of separation of, of church and state, because up until that point, um, the, if the Pope, like said that you weren't worthy of being a king and you didn't go through like the proper coronation process, then like because Catholicism was such a, a massive force, like you were like your, your rule, which was, mm -hmm. I'm kind of rambling now, but uh, your rule, I, I, I studied history before I went into math and physics. Well, they could just, they could just take your entire title away from you in essence. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 you know, the people would listen to the Pope oftentimes more than they would listen mm -hmm. to the king. Right. Like, and, you you, just, you can go to Brooklyn and find an Italian family that's like I, I listen to what the Pope says before the president and like yep. it's still yep. a thing right like uh, my grandma was like that my grandma was like what the Pope says goes um, <laughs> and, and so he had the, the wherewithal to realize all this and he took the crown out of the Pope's hand and and put it on his own head he when he was exiled okay to I think it was Elba um, he it, it was like a um, it was a kind of a podunk island. We didn't have a military force. He, within like a few years, he put together a military force. Okay. And he stormed the shores of France and the, um, the, the king at the time, I think he was called the business king. What, I forgot what his name was, but he took over after Napoleon, uh, sent all of his armies to meet Napoleon. And Napoleon was there with like a couple hundred men at most. And Napoleon walked out in front of the army and said, like, do you want to serve your emperor or do you want to serve like, you know, this uh, this tax pay, like this uh, tax attorney or something like that? And the army, the French army joined him and then marched on Paris and sacked it. And just like, <laughs> this guy, this guy is like he's 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 he's, he's in a movie. He thinks he's in a movie. But, but it worked. Right. Like it yeah. worked. And it worked for decades until it didn't and, and he died. And it was like, but like there, there are definitely these people and, and I actually base, you know, a lot of, so, and, and there's actually a really great Star Trek episode about that where, you know, and not to completely geek out, but like, uh, I think it's it, Kirk puts Khan on a, on like a, a planet that has like stone age technology. Yeah. And then within a few years he comes back and he's, he's turned it into like a level five civilization. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and it's like that's based on Napoleon's story. Like that's and it's, it's even exaggerated all that much, right? Like, um, but like it, there are people like that throughout history, and um, I don't know if you've ever read Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time series. I, that's honestly my favorite series of all time. I be, only because Jordan any any named character or any character really that Rand meets has a definitive ending at, at some point it might be three four books down the line yeah but they have a definitive ending and i i'm obsessed with with the wheel of time but and he has you know unfortunately he died before um he could finish the series but his, his son i think his wife finished it for him but um he had this this brilliant concept that encapsulated uh what people like napoleon or george washington had going for them which was like this concept of a top varen and a top Varen was uh, a person where like the threads of history like weave around them. And like, so like when they're shot with an arrow, the arrow is like slightly off and, and goes around. Yeah. And, and they're like powerful enough to Varens where like uh, they could influence their surroundings so much that like when they walked through a town, uh, a, a fishmonger would drop like a bucket of fish and all the fish would land like uh, head up. And like, like silly things like that. It was like fantastical version, but then you read like the histories of, of, and the story of like Napoleon and you're like, people like this existed. Like people mm -hmm. that, like walk into a room, command it and change history. Like you and I change laundry. Like it, it's crazy. 
And oh, so anyways, I, everybody has the ability, in my opinion, everybody has the ability to manifest reality around them. If there is something that they actually want or something that they want to do, I, I think, I, in my opinion, and this might be esoterical, everyone has the ability literally to manipulate uh, reality around them. It just takes the dedication, it takes the willpower, and it takes the, the discipline in order to make sure what you're doing is going to move forward. And belief. There's, yeah. there's never been a great person that didn't believe that they could do great things, that they couldn't do great things, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, no one falls into uh, the kind of success that like I'm talking about, right? Like, um, but then at the end of the day, like they're just men and women and, and like they're human, right? But like for whatever reason, history like turns around them, like these individuals for decades sometimes. And it's, it's, it's like fascinating. It, it almost seems magical. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, going back to the lore a bit, I do bake some of that into the story. Um, now, what is your favorite fairy tale um, from Brothers Grimm and why? Ooh. Um, hard hitters. I know it's the hard hitters. I, so if you actually read the, the stories, they're a lot more gruesome than the, the uh, yeah. Disney versions of them, right? Um, I like Hansel and Gretel. Um, it's like the perfect story. Um, Little Red Riding Hood. Um, and, and kind of like what's really interesting is if you read the, the stories, because what, what the brothers did is they went all, all across the Russian principalities. Because before um, the Prussian uh, principalities, because before Germany was Germany, um, and it was united under like people like Bismarck and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it was a series of principalities that were Prussian. They, they were like city states, right? And they all had their own like stories and mythos. And so you actually have a lot of repeated stories with slight differences, uh, depending on where they took the story from, like which principality they, they took the story from. And so, you know, but they all, they all shared common threads and it's not too dissimilar to like how we have skunk ape or mm -hmm. Bigfoot. Like, uh, you know, a lot of these stories share, um, similarities and it's kind of like to the point where you're like are these stories real because like they're being told in isolation in similar ways enough that um you kind of you got to question it right like um anyways so yeah like really the classics i i love um very gruesome though oh yeah oh yeah a lot of people don't realize i mean well and it's same thing with a lot of nursery rhymes too people don't realize just exactly what they're singing when they sing these nursery rhymes yeah, like ring around the posing. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Um, all right. So the next one, uh, next question I got for you is: uh, Metazoo hits on the nostalgia factor, and the community is very close knit. As the franchise grows, do you feel more apt to da uh, draft from fans and followers while expanding, or would you rather hire somebody, for example, that may not entirely know what the brand is fully about, but has had great success in similar ventures? Um, so it's it's a mix, right? Like Metazoo has its roots and, and community involvement and um but as we grow and mature like obviously we need to hire on talents right so craig who's the C coo of san rio um has joined metazoo's board and and starting i believe next week he's going to start taking a much more active role um and he, he turned san rio america in into a company that was worth tens of millions of dollars and something that's worth billions of dollars now right like if you see Hello Kitty um, or anything really Sega related in the U.S. Uh, for the past five years, it's it's because of Craig, right? Um, and so he understands collectability. He understands branding, um, all things which are not unique to MetaZoo. Um, but like even I think it was like during MetaZoo hour, somebody suggested something two days ago. And I was like, I'm stealing that. Like, <laughs> um, like it's a collaborative effort, right? Like, um, mm -hmm. even the name of our, of our fusion auras was community driven. Uh, oh, well, it was, uh, it was a uh, Chris or a uh, dad hat yesterday even was, uh, like, uh, what was it? Um, tribal aura. And you're like, Ooh, I like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but you know, and, and so like, it would be stupid. Like, and, and it, it comes from a place of being a lifelong fan of things where I wanted to change things. And if like, if I only, I could have a, a conversation with the creator and, and like, I think 
because you'll, you'll see these forums and like subreddits and stuff discussing like, oh, like I'm not sure how it's going to end, but wouldn't it be cool if this happens? And then like sometimes I think the creators read those forums and actually implement suggestions. Uh, I don't think it's ever spoken about, but I'm much more public about it. And so mm -hmm. if you're a Zoo fan, you know that I – interact with the community and I, I take suggestions and, and a lot of a, a good portion of what MetaZoo is, is has been the result of, of fan feedback. Well, just from the, the play, I mean, and this would be more, I guess the playing aspect too, but I mean, just like look at the play testers that you actually have to the full R and D department, everything like that. Like this is a, yeah, like you're saying, this isn't the first time that you've been like, oh, I really like that. I want to actually incorporate that into, uh, into either a product or a future set or something like that, yeah. which, I keep talking about it would be really cool maybe in Grimm's Kingdom if we could get like Fey energy or something. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. All right. I have time for one more question. I have to go walk my dog. <laughs> okay, no worries, no worries. Um, all right, so okay, let's uh, let's. This is actually a, a pretty big one that uh, I was curious about. You probably can't answer this one as well, but do we have any major character deaths coming up in War? Hmm. I'm not sure if I can uh, reveal that. Okay. Okay. I didn't think so. I didn't think so. Um, but um, once the book comes out, I, I would, I would love to, to, after I read it, of course, which I'm always available to proofread if, if, if you need, um, I would love <laughs> to actually talk more in depth about the actual book because I feel like the book is going to be times 10 when it comes to the amount of description and content and everything like that, like the comics have. For sure. Yeah. And, and, so somebody asked, uh, Mike, will you consider an order limit on the leather bound edition? Yeah. So we're going to, we're going to print a thousand of them. Um, they're going to be a bit more expensive because they're going to be leather bound. They're going to be annotated. They're going to have, they're going to be much more similar to the, uh, the comics in terms of, or the illustrated story, uh, chapters. Um, and they will all be signed and numbered by me individually. Um, and, um, I want them to stay in stock as long as possible. Um, and if it takes a while for them to sell, that's fine. Um, in fact, I think that's even better because I think that um, they're, it, it's going to be the addition for true fans. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'll be honest. I don't think they're going to stay in stock long because everybody I've talked to wants one of those, one of those books and not just because of the cards that are going to be in it or anything like that. But again, because like always going back to it, the actual, the, the, the history of, 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 of MetaZoo, if you will, because that is going to be the beginning of of the real, I mean, of the lore. I mean, yes, we have the comics, but that's going to be, the like you were talking about before, once the book comes out, there is no taking a step back. It's literally using what's established and moving forward. Exactly, yeah. Um, so, it'll be it'll be a historic moment, for sure. Uh, well, anything you'd like to, anything you'd like to, to, to say to the community before we, uh, we, we wrap it up? The first six chapters um, are available for free on metazoogames.com. Uh, give them a read if you want a kind of an intro to the lore. Um, otherwise, you know, this is a great channel to, um, to watch if you want a, um, you know, a dedicated fan's insight into what the potential of, of our upcoming lore can be. So, yeah. Well, well I, I, appreciate you, uh, I appreciate you stopping by. Um, I know that you I actually I, I, I'm going to throw it not this isn't going to be a last question, but it's a statement at least. I know that you like to make the joke that you eat, you eat sample cards. So I would like to start a petition to where you don't eat any more Loveland Frogman cards until I can actually acquire one. Um, I all, all the ones that I have. So you're OK, you're good, good. Whew. Um, but thank you so much for for taking the time to talk with me. This this has been this has been awesome. I mean, from everything from talking to, to, to manga and anime to you bringing up like Outlaw Star to the deep dive in some of the lures and all, all of it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I cannot wait to actually meet you and shake your hand uh, in New York. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm excited for uh, for I guess Argos tonight at five is actually going to show off the first of the spoilers starting in this spoiler season, which is my favorite season. Yes. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't I cannot thank you enough for joining me. Yeah, uh, pleasure's all mine, and let's do it again. Of course, of course. All right, just so everybody knows, that right there is the uh, creator of MetaZoo. Uh, very, very grateful that he was able to jump in here, actually, with me. 
And um, I'm working on the water tower video that hopefully should be out sometime in the next couple days. I'm going to try to see if I can get it finished tonight, maybe. And then um, we'll be back to our regular scheduled lore. I got a bunch of stuff. They just released a new video and things like that. Or a new a picture today of a card. So I got to actually start looking that up. And I got a laundry list of theory videos that I need to get to, including the timeline video. But uh, I will say the biggest thing that I loved about that interview was actually him saying that Indrid and Adam do not have blood ties because that I've been thinking of that that for a long, long time now. So awesome. I got to reevaluate some stuff. But you all are amazing. Thank you, everybody that jumped in uh, to actually watch this. Uh, make sure to go over to uh, Cardboard and Coffee. They're about to premiere their water tower video here, I believe, in about 15 minutes or so. And then Argos is actually going to be uh, showing the first spoiler for spoiler season over the next three four weeks uh join me next monday i will have a spoiler i'm not sure exactly how we're going to show it or whatnot um but uh we're potentially going to try to do another casters and cryptids maybe sometime in the next couple weeks i know that gary king pokemon is actually going to be coming on the channel at one point to actually talk with us um we're going to try to actually get some more interviews with more content creators collectors members of the community things like that you all are amazing. I love each and every single one of you. And uh, I guess I will see you guys later. All right. Have a good night.